I now call this regular meeting of the Davenport Community School District Board of Directors to order. Would everyone please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Director Poshin, would you please read the mission and vision statements? Mission statement, the Davenport Community School District is dedicated to growing excellence in academics, the arts, and athletics for every child by ensuring the highest quality education in an environment shaped by our diverse community, preparing our students to be lifelong learners and productive citizens. Vision statement, education that challenges conventional thinking prepares all students to compete in a global society and inspires our students, parents, staff, and community to answer the question, what if? Thank you. Director Beck, would you please read the guiding principles? Yes. Opportunity. We provide abundant opportunities to empower students to reach their full potential academically, creatively, and socially. Collaboration. We foster an environment that allows students, families, and community stakeholders to come together for the betterment of our students' education and future. Transparency. We share relevant and important information with our students, families, and the community to maintain open and productive communication. Thank you. Superintendent Schneckloff, would you please read the goals? Goal number one, enhance student learning is our focus for tonight. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to the public hearing. I will now conduct a public hearing on the plans and specifications for the Monroe and Washington demolition projects as shown in the 95% plans and specifications. Notice of the hearing was published in the Quad City Times on May 10th, 2023. Anyone wishing to speak on this item, please step forward to the microphone or call 1-312-626-6798. And enter meeting ID 972 8858 6865 and passcode 855 416. State your name and address for the record. Uh, sir. Push the button so the light will go on green. There we go. My name is Chris Meyer. I live at 917 Grand Court. Um, my kids both went to Washington Elementary School. Um, I would like to request the board reconsider demolition of the schools, Washington and Monroe, or at least delay voting to demolish them. I know it feels like it's already decided, uh, and everybody says it's basically a done deal. I find that strange since the elected officials, you guys haven't voted on it yet, but everything seems like it's moving forward that these schools are gonna be demolished. Um, if, if the school board always just rubber stamps what the administration says, I don't really understand the point of an elective board. Um, the school district over the last number of years has been losing the public's trust. I'm a big defender of Davenport schools. I graduated from Central. I have for years defended Davenport schools, but lately it's getting harder and harder. Um, most people don't follow it very closely, but when you start talking to them about it, they don't like the things that have been happening. And they'll definitely notice when these beautiful 80-year-old buildings start being demolished. Um, everyone I've talked to was unaware of the plans. They don't understand why it's happening. I tell them, well, they're going to expand Sudlow, and they're going to take out the cafeteria into classrooms, make the new gym that was just built fairly recently into a cafeteria, and build another new gym. And obviously everyone responds to this with just wonder, like why is that the smartest use of our money? Meanwhile, in Washington in particular, we've got the Creative Arts Academy, which could have the entire Washington school themselves with an auditorium right across the campus, and then they could still attend their regular classes at Sudlow, and that would make some room for the sixth graders. Monroe would be much needed housing. We have a housing shortage in Davenport, I'm sure because every school that's been closed in Davenport has been put into productive reuse. None have been demolished over the years, and they've closed a lot of schools, 
and they're all doing good things now. I don't see why this needs to be the first time we start demolishing schools. Um, the money could be spent on other things. And if Sudlow desperately needs more, I think there's probably a way to expand it without tearing down Washington. And uh, I'm less familiar with the smart situation. Um, but I know just a few years ago, there was talked about closing smart. And then the sixth graders were moved back and forth. Um, and now we're talking about expanding the junior highs. Just the average public is confused as to what is happening here. And it's hard to trust the school board of always doing the right thing when it was the right thing to move the sixth graders back to the elementary schools a few years ago. And now that's a problem. So we need to move them back to the junior highs and spend a ton of money expanding the junior highs. I would just ask that we slow down on this. I don't understand what the hurry is because the Sudlow expansion, as far as I know, won't be completed by the time that the sixth graders move back to Sudlow. So clearly there's room in Sudlow to make it a year. Um, so why not wait a little bit, maybe explore the idea of using Washington and, and, and selling Monroe um, for a better use so we don't have to tear down these beautiful buildings. My mom graduated from Washington. There's such a history with the community at these buildings, and it's nice to have shiny new things, but that's not the reason Davenport schools are struggling. We need to market the good stuff. Most people don't even know about the Creative Arts Academy. Um, and it seems like all we're doing is planning for our slow demise instead of figuring out ways to invigorate things. Like a, a shiny new gym and cafeteria is not going to draw people away from Catholic schools or Bettendorf. We need to explain why Davenport schools are better than those districts and a better alternative. And our history and our, our old buildings are part of that. They're part of the character of the district. So I just think we're going in the wrong direction, but it seems like it's all already decided. Um, I would hope that you can change your minds. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any others? I know you came in a little late. What we're doing right now, we're doing the public hearing on the plans and specifications for the Washington and Monroe demolition projects. And it looks like that's what your open forum is. So uh, if you want, as I stated to the gentleman before you come up to the microphone, state your name and address for the record. Make sure you push the button so the green light's on. Uh, hello, I'm, I'm Bill Handel. I'm a retired architect. Uh, Grew up in, I live in Nashville right now. I grew up in, uh, in Davenport and graduated from West High School, great school district, and, and appreciate all the work you do to keep, uh, keep the, the quality of education there. And, uh, but just as the previous gentleman said, it's, uh, it's also buildings too, and, and the buildings uh, of a school district, much like the churches of our, of our religion uh, kind of uh, tell us where our values lie and, and what we have to say about our past and, uh, and about our future. Um, I'm a retired architect and, uh, and uh, I, I went to Monroe School for uh, kindergarten and part of first grade. And, and it was, you know, although I was aware of buildings even then, but um, I particularly remember the uh, the kindergarten in, in the Monroe uh, Elementary School as being one of the most child friendly environment I'd ever seen. There was like a, a a fish pond or a turtle pond on one side, and and there was a, a like a play area. You went up some a ladder or some steps up into that, and and uh, and you looked down into this high space. And I think there was even a fireplace. In the room, and there were bookshelves, and and uh, and the, the 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 clock was right at a kid's height. And I remember being five years old, coming home to my folks and telling them how I could learn how I'd learn how to tell time, and and they were just astounded by that, and and loved me for it. I loved them for recognizing it. But anyway, back to the story. Uh, just like a, the Catholic Church in, in this uh, Davenport has not has not seen fit to demolish any of its fine churches, even though 
the attendance is a fraction of what it was in the past, and, and a couple of them have gone to other uses. I, I feel, especially at this, just to, to do it right now has got to be one of the worst decisions that could be made. Um, I also went to Johnson School, which, you know, as you know, uh, was not torn down, but was, was sold, I guess, to a, a private person. I remember even at that time, Taylor School was sold, and I'm glad Taylor School now has found a nice uh, adaptation after many years. The old Holy Family School, of course, was at one time a, a public uh, elementary school, and it's it's even as it, you know it predates Monroe by a long time. Anyway, I don't know. I just I, a couple years ago I got somewhat involved in the preservation of Audubon School in Rock Island, and and I, and I was thinking to myself, I live in Nashville. I just happen to be here this week. I said, well, you know, certainly the, the same kind of fine folks that are in Rock Island, even more of them are going to come to the, the aid of Monroe and Washington schools. And, and I was just kind of shocked to see that. I mean, in, in Rock Island, then, they built this, uh, you, you know, they, they built this accelerated academy or something on the Villa de Chantel site when they could have just as well Done a done a nice job to renovate Audubon School or turn Audubon School into administration like you did here. Um, but anyway, I just find it just almost unthinkable that, that a building that is it that building is Monroe School is one of the finest international. It's called international style if you if you know architecture. If the architect from Bray is here tonight, he knows what I'm talking about. It, he knows that, that it's a building worth, or she knows it's a building worth keeping. And, uh, and it's, it's a remarkable building. It's in good shape now, I think. Uh, it's the kind of building, and uh, I'd love to have an apartment in that building facing south now that the traffic on 4th Street isn't what it used to be. Uh, one of those classrooms, it would be a wonderful two-bedroom apartment. I don't know, it, without even considering uh, its potential for an adaptive reuse, I just feel you're just going the wrong way. And I, I really hope that even at this late time that you'll reconsider this. And I think the people in the West End and the people in Central Davenport would would thank you, even if they haven't expressed it so far. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Is there any others? Any others? Any others? Seeing, hear, seeing and hearing none, I now declare the public hearing closed. May I have a motion? Director Postum. Mr. President. <clears throat> Move the board approve the plans and specifications for the Monroe and Washington demolition project as shown in the 95% plans and specifications. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been moved and seconded. I will call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. It's not working. Like that. All right. I'll wait. Is there any discussion? I do have one question. Josh, could you clarify? What are we talking about money if we were to bring those buildings up to, I think I remember 8 million and 10 million, would that be correct? It would be more than that. <clears throat> okay. I don't know exactly what numbers we haven't, I mean, we did it early on. I, I don't remember off the top of my head what that number was, but it's more than that. Okay. <laughs> Director Beck. And just to clarify, that's, for example, to make uh, Washington, say, usable as a home for other programs, correct? The 8 to 10 million? Yeah. Uh, I don't think for we ever got into the details of figuring out what it would be used for outside of that. Um, okay, but it would cost that much money to bring one of, uh, one of those buildings up to usable code at this point? I, I believe it would. Okay. Yeah. And then my my question would be, has anyone 
uh, have there been any legitimate offers that uh, with backing to purchase those properties? I'm not aware of any. Any other discussion? Hang on one second. Uh, Director Potts, did you have any questions? No, I don't have any questions. I just got logged in. I had to switch computers. I don't know what the deal is, but I'm here now, and I would certainly support the motion. Both. Well, I'll call for the vote in a minute. But I was just saying. Well, both, both Smart and Sudlow need that space. Okay. Thank you, uh, Director Beck. And just to confirm, um, I know we've asked a number of uh, a number of people have asked us um, what kinds of things we're pulling out of those buildings. Um, if we've been allowing uh, people access to any historical artifacts that may or may be there and that kind of thing, and you've explored all of those options, is that correct? We've we've been looking through those options. We've had a number of people ask for things. I could probably give you a huge list of people that want to come in there and tear the building apart and take all kinds of things. Um, but in order to keep things in order and people safe, uh, we haven't allowed a bunch of people in there to do that at this point. Um, we have taken a few items for the district to keep within the district um, at this point. Okay, and all the teacher materials and everything, those have been upcycled, reused, transported to other locations. It's going on as if we speak. they're still in good shape, yeah. Yep, everything's going on as we speak, really. Thank you. Yep. Director Postum. I also want to point out that this isn't a decision that was just made here in the last few days. This has been put forth for the Citizens Committee um, for the Long Range Planning Committee. Um, there was all kinds of press on this. Um, and so to come here at this point and uh, have objections uh, to the demolition, I think is, is a little late. Um, there was a lot of time and uh, commitment made by our long range planning committee, which was made up of uh, citizens, uh, parents, um, teachers, administrators. So I think this has been, been well thought out and uh, um, I wholeheartedly support um, the recommendations that the long range planning committee um, has made. Is there any other discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Motion carries, or ayes have it, motion carries. I see there are no recognitions tonight. Uh, we'll move on to presentations. Uh, First presentation is Davenport Schools Museum, Washington Bell Plaque. I'll turn it over to the superintendent. Well, tonight we have Sue Berger, retired Davenport Schools librarian and a very proud supporter of our museum. Um, and tonight we're gonna talk about the very special piece of property that we have on the Washington School grounds. Um, I, I will say that I'm really proud of the de dedication that occurred on the last day of school. And so Sue, thank you for coming out and leading us through that. And so I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Okay. Um, good evening. My name is Susan Berger, and I'm here as a volunteer representing the Davenport School Museum, located on the first floor of this building. On behalf of the museum, I want to thank you for granting us some time to present a project that we recently completed. I was at a city council meeting in March where Davenport students were recognized for their art projects. I believe the fourth graders worked on landmarks for their unit. We've got a landmark that honors our schools and our city, which, may be, which maybe should be added to their list of choices. That landmark is a bell tower located on East Locust Street on the western edge of Washington Elementary School property. So little background is needed in order to understand the historical significance of this landmark and our project. Next one. The Davenport Independent School District was formed in 1858, just 26 years after the incorporation of the city of Davenport. This year, the district is celebrating its 165th year. 
in 1865, a two-story brick building with six rooms that, that replaced a wood frame building in the village of East Davenport, opened at the corner of 12th and Mississippi, the site of the current Temple Emanuel building, 1865, time of Abraham Lincoln, close of the Civil War, almost 160 years ago. It was aptly named School Number One. It was the first tax, it was the first public tax supported school in Davenport. You might say the grandfather or the great grandfather of all of our public tax supported schools. In 1908, now with 14 buildings, all named with numbers, the school board decided to name the schools after the presidents in order. School number one became known as Washington. Next one. In 1940, thanks to PWA money, the Public Works Administration, in a bond referendum, six new schools were opened, including the current Washington on the corner of East Locus and Eastern Avenues. If you think it was hard closing three buildings this past fall, when these six new buildings opened, 12 were closed. Next one. Before the old Washington was torn down, a committee was formed by teachers and former students to erect a memorial to, quote, perpetuate the memory of the old Washington, close quote which had served the community for 75 years. This memorial was approved by the school. In June of 1943, 80 years ago, the bell tower was dedicated. Next. As you can see, you can no longer read the inscription on the front stone, which says, Subdistrict Number 1, A.D. 1865. This photo on the right-hand side shows the old building, the old Washington, and where the stone on the bell tower came from. From this photograph, I believe the original inscription is still there, and of course, it is the original stone from the old building. The foundation stones of the bell tower are also from the foundation of the old Washington itself. Next one. The timbers that support the bell, the bell that would have summoned students to school for many years, both the timbers and the bell are also from the old Washington. The only thing not from the old building is a roof that protects the tower itself. In the fall of 2021, well over a year before it was announced that Washington would be closing, the museum looked into having this landmark recognized. It proved too costly and probably not feasible to have that front stone reinscribed. Even if it was reinscribed, it did need some explanation. Next one. So, after permissions were granted and funds were donated, <clears throat> a brass plaque was cast and installed in early April of this year. Yes, it took a year and a half to complete this project. <laughs> I've met with Superintendent Schneckloff and he has assured me that regardless what is done with the building or the grounds, the bell tower will not be torn down and if necessary, relocated. After all, it is a landmark to all of our schools and the city of Davenport. Next one. What put this all into perspective was that while I was researching this project, I learned that the committee which had this memorial built had hoped that, quote, Someday there would be a bronze tablet bearing some of the history of school number one, close quote. Well, it's taken 80 years, <laughs> but that landmark is finally complete. On June 1st, Washington had a closing ceremony, which included a bell tower rededication. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your support of the museum. Come and visit us sometime. Any questions? Uh, director Beck. Um, I don't have any questions. I just wanted to say thank you for this presentation <laughs> and for the preservation you've been doing with our buildings. Um, uh, and I really love this story uh, that, you know, a building was taken down in 1940 that had already been, you know, 70 years old and they saved all these bits and pieces. And we've been having discussions about mm -hmm. what should we be saving from buildings now. Um, and it's just kind of a neat full circle. I, I know in August that the, um, I believe it was John Flynn said that some of the museum volunteers could come through the buildings that are closing and see what we can repurpose or put into the museum too. So that's going to be. Yep. So when you said, are people going through that? And I'm like, no, not yet. <laughs> let, us <in> there, <laughs> let us in there first, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But and yeah, there uh, are some things we took, we were in there earlier this year, actually a couple months ago and took pictures of various rooms in the auditorium and the gyms and that. And had an idea of what's there, what the museum could possibly use and preserve. We have limited space, which 
TJ will tell you we've asked for more space on that too. <laughs> <laughs> and he could tell you I could talk a lot longer on this, but he told me I couldn't, so. <laughs> well, thank you for, for the plaque and thank you for doing this. Um, and I look forward to seeing how we uh, preserve the, yeah. the it, other buildings. It, it sat there a long time and I drove by. I actually worked at Washington for 12, 14 years and saw it gradually decrease and we could not have it reinscribed because the stone is very soft and it wouldn't be worth it. So it's like, we need something on there. It needs to be preserved. Director Klein, Julie. Um, I just also would like to put in a plug. I have gone through the museum uh, a couple times. It is well worth your time. I've it's, seen you down there, yes. Yeah, <laughs> it's cool to see things that you're like, I remember that from a long time ago. And uh, yeah, that's it's a very nice museum to go through. Of course, the, dis the, dis the display case is on the second and third floor also as part of the museum, the things that we put in there too. Thank you very much for your presentation. I appreciate all the time you put into it as well. Uh, up next, we have uh, a presentation on Chance. Turn it over to the superintendent. Thank you. We have our team of Cami Montoya, Lisa Baxter, and Courtney Olson are going to give us more information on our Chance uh, program that we are looking to adopt in our district. This team has worked really hard to cascade the information through our district. And so they're here to expand on the uh, expand the information given to the school board. All right, good evening, Board of Directors. Thank you very much for this opportunity to bring champs back in front of you. We really appreciated the questions you asked last time and the insight you provided, which really allowed us as a team in the cabinet to relook at it and come back um, with a different proposal, as well as provide you additional information so that you can feel like you're making a well-informed decision. So I'm gonna pass it over to uh, Lisa Baxter. All right, Ivy, you can drive for me. Courtney, thank you. All right, so thank you for this opportunity to present more information about CHAMPS. Here are our intended outcomes. We will share district data, one data point highlighting classroom referrals. We will describe the need for more tier one classroom management support across our district. And we will explain how CHAMPS, if adopted, will benefit our system. As you know, we adhere to the Iowa Continuous Improvement Model, and tonight's outcomes align nicely with examining our current state, understanding the story behind our data, and then formulating a plan for continuous improvement. So why are we here, and why is this important? Well, teaching is hard. No doubt, it is an incredibly rewarding profession, but teaching has become increasingly more challenging over the years. Pre-COVID, the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, reported that one in five children suffered from a mental, emotional, or behavioral disorder. Recent data suggests that one third of today's children exhibit social, emotional, and or behavioral difficulties that impair some aspect of their daily functioning. And where do students spend a great majority of their time? At school, within the four walls of a classroom. So the world has changed, and whether you are a new teacher or a veteran teacher, the work placed in front of us is different now. We can't change the CDC's statistics but we can change the way we manage our spaces, our classrooms, so that all of our students will be successful. What you see on this slide is a pie chart visually illustrating referrals from last school year. If you add up both sides of the circle, the slide shows that nearly 41,000 major and minor referrals were entered into our classroom management system. Of those referrals, approximately 57% originated from the classroom. 
Now, when referrals are entered, there are 20 different locations to choose from. And we are not seeing statistically high incidence of behavior happening in those other common building locations, like the bus, the playground, hallways, restrooms, lunchroom. All those other locations are re represented by the orange area. So to summarize, last year, over 23,000 referrals came from one location, the classroom. And those classroom referrals represented 57% of all referrals made. I want to point out that we have PBIS in our system and have had success based on our data in those common areas, those other locations that we just pointed out in the orange. PBIS is a framework that helps schools build the tiers, tiers one, two, and three, that are needed for a robust MTSS, multi-tiered system of support. PBIS is not a curriculum you purchase or something you learn in a day or two of professional development training. PBIS incorporates the use of evidence-based practices, data, advocates for the engagement of families and stakeholders, and PBIS is built upon the implementation of strong building PBIS teams that monitor building outcomes and identify strengths and weaknesses of the system. So PBIS is an ongoing commitment that we will support students and families using best practices and systems change based on our data. And we have made progress in the evidence-based practice of having school-wide expectations, for example. As I referenced in the prior slide, our data confirms we have less referrals and disruptions in our common school areas. That's a direct result of PBIS school-wide efforts. What we have never had in our system is depth of support for teacher classroom management systems, the location most of our referrals are coming from. We know we need to use high leverage evidence-based practices in our classrooms, and we have started that work. But teachers deserve more explicit guidance and support in that area. It is not enough as a teacher to know that I have to have routines and procedures in my classroom because that's an evidence-based practice. I also need to know, well, what are those routines? How many routines do I need? How will they look for my students? How will I develop them? How will I teach them? How will I monitor my classroom routines? This is the next step of our work and just a part of what CHAMPS will offer our teachers. So over this past year, our department recognized the need to support classroom management systems. And additionally, other task teams analyzing referral data came to the same conclusion. If we want to reduce the number of referrals in Davenport schools, we need to focus where students spend the majority of their time and where most of our referrals are coming from. So our department started exploring professional development for classroom management, and CHAMPS quickly surfaced as something we should consider. Coincidentally, around that same time, the Department of Education was in Davenport, and they concluded required site visits at our comprehensive buildings. And the DE also recommended we look into CHAMPS after those visits. So up next, Cami will further explain details about CHAMPS and why we are asking for your blessing to move forward with this proposal. Thank you, Lisa. So if you see this slide here, this is the acronym that CHAMPS, I would say, bases everything around, very similar to how we roll out PBIS <clears throat> in our system. So in every aspect of CHAMPS, 
all of these things are taken into play. So in, in all transparency, it was hard to put together a couple slides to even depict all of the things Champs offers because it is so in depth in that two day training. So we did our best to at least paint, you know, a clear picture of what's there. So in every aspect that they teach teachers, so it begins from the second that they see those kids at the door, that there is a, you know, a name that is said to every single student, an, an emotional connection, an interaction. It starts at that very depth of how the students enter the room and what they deserve before they even reach their seat, all the way to the ending and their fa farewell when they leave at the end of the day or the class period. So in all of those, and in and throughout, I should say, all of those structures, all of these are taken into play. What does the conversation look like? How does a student ask for help if they need it? What activities should they be doing? What level of movement um, do the students deserve during that time? What does the participation look like and how does the teacher gauge success? So in all aspects of what CHAMPS teaches teachers um, for classroom management purposes, all of these are embedded throughout you know, the whole time. I will say what excited me the most when we came across CHAMPS was something I said as a building administrator for the, I think, 12, 13 years that I did it. We are so good at teaching the t kids how to walk down the hallway. We are so good at telling them this is how you wash your hands, you sing your ABCs, for example, so on and so forth. We're good at telling our high school kids you have three minutes, get there, right? But what we're not, what we've never had the depths of, and what I always said is, you know, we're so good, our kids could recite that in their sleep part of the time. But the second they cross that threshold into the classroom, everything was different for them. Think of our middle school kids who go to sometimes eight, seven, eight periods a day and every single thing is different. That we have not had anything in our system that has provided the consistency that those kids and teachers um, alike deserve. So this is what excited us the most about a lot of this is that it is something we have not had. It attaches directly to, to Lisa's point, PBIS and everything we've done with PBIS, but this is now the depth and the how of how a teacher can manage and really builds that consistency if I'm in a kindergarten classroom all the way through 12th grade, that I know that I can walk into any room, our transient population, for example, um, from one building to the next, and there will be some consistency. I always like to kind of reference it as like why people like McDonald's, right? Because everything is the same. You know what to expect when you get there. That's really a piece of what we're looking for. Also, of course, having the autonomy for teachers to make it their own. So what is CHAMPS? Again, it's the, the proactive, the two pieces that it really hinges upon is the proactive and the positive approach. That we don't, we have not done a diligent job um, in education you know, as a whole um, to teach teachers ahead of time to be thinking through all of those things. So on this slide, you can just see some examples. Each of these examples have a whole section in the training with eight, nine, 10, 11 pieces, that subsets that go to teach the teachers how to do this. So it is a model that aims to improve student behavior plus strengthen the learner engagement. That's a huge piece of this. Um, the other piece that we really, um, that really you know, brought us to this was the CLR, the culture responsive practices are all built into here. And that's something that we hadn't seen to date. It helps those classroom to teachers develop or fine tune, and I love the fine tune piece because this is where it really talks to, it's not just for new teachers and new educators that have only been teaching a few years. This is to, you know, the um, statistic at the beginning, society, our world, the kids in front of us have changed. Whether we've been teaching five, 10, 15, 25 years, the, you know, the world is different. The act of education has to be different. I mean, insert social media, insert technology. We never had to have, you know, in-depth procedures around what social media means in the classroom and what it doesn't, what it means to use technology in the classroom and what it doesn't. And this really gives teachers what they deserve um, in the aspect of, you know, just helping them through all of those things. Um, you know, and just very consistent and reliable findings that, that this is based on what best teachers do naturally. You know, there are many teachers, to everyone's point, that do all of this naturally. I will say as the years go on and burnout happens and society's harder, less are those teachers, right? Because it's just people don't stay around as long. But some people this comes naturally too. Not everybody it does. And this really, this foundation gives us the opportunity to take our best educators and make them the model, to take our best administrators and give them the tools of how to coach their teachers through next steps. So again, you know, we could hit on this point a lot, but I think we've made, you know, the point at least to this point that it aligns absolutely with PBIS. Again, go back to that. We teach them how to do many things very consistently in our matrix that are on our walls, in all of our common areas, but each classroom operates different. 
and that is okay on a certain scale. But we do need those consistent and research-based practices and procedures that help all of our um, teachers to be as successful as you know, some of our best, for sure. The depths of kind of that last bullet, too, just really talks about it. The training, um, and you can find the PDF online and we can share it with you. If you even walk through the tasks, you know, that are in each chapter of this just really shows the depth of things we've never had. How to predict misbehaviors, how to get in front of the misbehaviors, how to do, you know, proactive techniques so that those behaviors don't occur. That's a depth of thing that we have never given our teachers in the past in, our, in its entirety for sure. So what are the desired outcomes? Well, you know, for teachers, it is to give them the tools. Again, we're talking brand new teachers. I think that's what we're most excited about. I think as a new teacher going into education, if I would have had this two-day training, um, I think I just I would have been a different first-year teacher for sure. Um, so really, it, again, just going to it's not only that, but all the teachers who have been teaching 25 years. Every one of these aspects, as you can kind of just take a look there and you've already seen, teachers, especially teachers who have been doing it a long time, have a skill set in, but everybody can take a step forward. Everybody can fine tune, tweak, change, and really capitalize on some of these things, especially when the kids in front of them have changed. And again, this is where I would just hit on, it really takes our best teachers and makes them the model for everybody else. What this does, I hit on this already a little bit, but it gives administrators that tool. So many times as an administrator, you're evaluating teachers with not a whole lot to go off of. And this really gives um, administrators those pieces to really you know, base a lot of those things on to say, where are we as a system? What do we need to move? What does our PD need to look like? Um, things like that. You can't, just going to that point, you can't set a tier two, a stage for tier two without a solid tier one. And our data that you saw at the beginning shows we currently do not have a solid tier one as far as our classroom management practices go district wide. It is teacher driven. That is what one of the pieces we like the best about this. This is not a someone comes in the back of the room with a clipboard and I'm going to watch you and tally how many times you do this, that, or the other. This is about these teachers go through this two day training and they learn what does it look like when my kids are on task? How many opportunities to respond should I be giving my students daily in a five minute time, in a 30 minute time? How many numbers, what number of disruptions is acceptable? Um, what are my positive to corrective interactions? For example, this is PBIS, right? That five to one, it used to be four to one, it's evolved to five to one now, that five positive interactions for every correction. Well, this gives the how. Here's the list of ways that you can have those positive interactions with your students that are those outside the box things, my, you know, graduating beyond the nice job, way to go, that kind of thing, um, and those expectations. So the teachers are taught this in their two-day training, and then they evaluate themselves along the way, and they have a coaching team, which we'll get to in a moment, that they provide. They say, I really realize my opportunity to respond. I want to enhance that. Help me with that. So they, it's very teacher-driven in the um, ways of how to move along on these scales. So that's another piece that we were really you know, drawn to with those quantifiable measures, which is actually something we've never had in the past in the classroom as well. Champ space is everything on a three-part target. This is kind of their premise of everything. What do we want people to know? Which that are, is all the tasks in the PDF of that, you know, training at the beginning and then the ongoing coaches. What do we want them to do? That goes back to the teacher, admin, and student outcomes. And then how will we measure it? So Champs really, you know, grounds itself in that this is not a service, an initiative for new teachers and or just those struggling with misbehavior. All teachers are striving to do better at their craft, to go beyond what they did the day before. And the reality that was true today and the students that are sitting in front of us are not the same students that were sitting in front of us yesterday. One of the challenges, or I shouldn't say challenges, but one of the things that we challenged ourselves to do as a team, say who else is using this? What does this look like? Do, are there similar districts to us, any near us? And um, if you scroll up just a little, I think it's at the bottom. One we personally, oh, down, sorry. I meant scroll down. There you go, sorry. Um, so Sioux City, Council Bluffs, Waukee, and Cedar Rapids use it district-wide. Um, they We talked to a few people in their systems as well that are very, very happy with the outcomes of it, say it's not something that they see doing away with anytime soon, if ever. And we were able to personally speak to Sioux City as one of the leaders in this work um, that is closest to us in our area. And their administration said that we needed something to help teachers when they were alone in their classroom and are very happy with this training. We were, so they started, and this was their piece of advice to us, don't make it voluntary. If you make it voluntary, a few will strive, but you're 
best teachers will still stay where they are and they will not be that model. You're not creating the right system if you make it voluntary. So they said if they could do anything over, they would have made it, um, put it in the schedule and not a voluntary thing where they get paid over the summer to do if they choose. The other nice thing about this is, as you see here, is the picture of the, ex uh, the Growing with Excellence Summit that just happened. During this Growing with Excellence Summit, every building created a Growing with Excellence plan, and a large majority of those plans already have this built in in some capacity. We need classroom management training. We need to look at our classroom management data or our classroom referral data. We need to, you know, all of these things are already very specifically in some buildings' plans. This just fits perfectly into what they already know and want to do. And these are teachers. These are administrators, these are counselors, eclectic groups of people that actually said this is the work that they wanted to do. So finally brings us to the budget, which I think highlights a few things that we changed in the proposal from last time. Um, we did decide to take high school cohort out at this time and solely focus on really two areas, the new teachers and the new to district hires, which they would get these two days in training before the school year began. And then also our comprehensive schools, um, which would be Smart, Williams, Jefferson, and um, Madison. And then really looking at Mid-City as an opportunity as well. If we were able to train all of our comprehensive buildings, we could also add in our Strat 2 teachers and our alternative programming teachers. For example, our redirection at the high school, long-term discipline placement teachers, that type of thing. And we feel that if we hit those two cohorts, we'd be you know, really hitting two goals. All new teachers and new to district hires, as well as all of our staff that are working with our most at-risk kids in our district. And we thought that would be a really nice place to start. The comprehensive, there's five comprehensive, sorry. Um, Jefferson, Madison, Williams, Smart, and Mid-City. I think that all is all that I have. As well as all of our staff that are working with our most at risk. Please don't do that. <laughs> Any questions? You didn't have a slide that said question. Nope. Surprising you. I was wondering why everybody got quiet. Questions? I'm going to go with Director Hayes first, and then I'll go to you. Thank you. Um, thanks for the presentation. You, uh, on the screen, were desired outcomes. You had mentioned consequences in there. Do you have any idea or any example of those consequences? Also, it's you stated it was designed for the pe teacher. Could there's not like a blue book that everyone does the same thing. You do what works best for you. In those consequences, I guess my question is: Is that district wide or just for your particular classroom? Because I'm thinking if um, some students move several times a year, if they go to a different school, will that then change the program for them or how does that work? Great question, I think I can respond to that. If, if I'm understanding the question correctly, PBIS states that you have to teach your teachers to have their own built-in classroom management system with consequences involved the one building system can't take care of all of it. So really this gives tips and tools to say, if a student is not doing this, what are you going to have in your room? Is it, you know, there and there be a list of things that teachers can create, but it's more to get them to start thinking. Now, if they don't, is it, this is it a parent phone call. It, it really helps them, for example, is it they stay in for, you know, just to get them to pre-think through those things so that they can have their own system that doesn't always have to go straight to the building management system but it doesn't give them the direct, concrete, exact consequences to give. Thank you. And the goal is to systematize it, right? So that's what having this framework would do that building to building as well. Okay. Director Beck. Um, <clears throat> I have several questions, but um, there are two that um, I, uh, I want to ask now. Um, so from what I understand with the Department of Education reports, they are going to pay for us to implement something like 
they use champs as an example, but it was apparently just for smart. Is that correct? The way I read the report. Great. Yes, the Department of Ed is going to help fund this. Okay, and so um, I guess what is the initial? I mean, given that that Smart was visited, it's a it's an extended comprehensive school, if I'm correct. What is the reasoning for making this district wide? Well, I guess you said to all the comprehensive schools, correct? Um, correct. I guess why why not start it in that one school where? the DE said, hey, you guys really could benefit from this. Mm -hmm. um, why not just start there and make sure it works for us first? So this was actually a recommendation in both Madison and SMART's plans. Okay. And then in conversation with MidCity, they are also interested because their main focus was engagement, and this also supports engagement. Um, also learning from our extended comprehensive buildings, thinking we want to be proactive with their currently identified comprehensive buildings and looking at data review, it would support that it could be a need there. So we really do see this as a cohort starting with those buildings. And that was feedback we received from you guys last time that let's start smaller mm -hmm. um, before we have a plan district wide. Okay. Um, and then my other question, um, I noticed that I know there are other um, programs like Champs is one thing, and the company that, that we're being asked to vote on is one company that delivers Champs uh, support, I guess is the way to describe it. Um, but there are other examples um, of different types of classroom management systems, and I know you guys said that this one rose to the top. What specifically about this is different from, say, I think um, the DE said there's another responsive classroom. I know there's other, lots of other companies that do the same kind of thing. What about this company and Champs, I guess, is what is better, why we're choosing this one? So yes, we looked at a couple of different things and to the point at the beginning, there were several teams that were looking at many different things and each team kind of rose to this coming to the top for a couple of reasons. Um, number one, a lot of the things we looked at on the surface looks like it has all of these things involved when you really dive in. PBIS, for example, and our partnership with them, it's a framework, lots of suggestions, lots of things, but it doesn't really give you the kind of the meat and potatoes, I would say, to really systematize something in a system as large as ours, for example. So that was one thing. We also loved the coaching piece that goes along with it that is not evaluative, that it's teacher driven, that it has quantifiable measures so that the teachers are driving their plans with this. It's not somebody coming in and telling them what they need to do. It's you know self-exploration, things like that. So those are just a few examples of really what brought this to the top for us. And we, I mean, we looked at high reliability schools, we looked at, you know, some, several other things, and nothing really has this in its entirety. Okay, and then my, my follow-up question, um, I know other districts are using it, um, and I didn't catch, have you guys talked with teachers who are using this system? I heard districts and I heard administrator, but I didn't, wasn't sure if I missed something. Um, some testimonials from teachers. I don't need to hear them. I just, <laughs> yeah, I, I did not reach out to any other teachers in those other districts, just some of the higher level administrators. Director Poshton. At the last meeting that this was discussed, we talked about uh, just uh, smart Madison and mid city. So, uh, how did Williams and Jefferson get added to this? My recollection is all the buildings were listed there with the high schools in our last proposal. So, this proposal would be removing the high schools. Okay. Now, <clears throat> would would this? Do you think the school district would be doing this if um, that? Uh, wasn't recommended by the Department of Ed. Do you think you would still participate in this? 
I'm getting excited to respond to these. Yes, it was unique and interesting and almost like kind of like the last piece of the puzzle that there were several task teams. Um, and if even at the beginning of the slides, I mean, these were administrators, these were surveys to teachers, these were counselors, lots of entities were a part of this that came to Champs being pushed as a proposal and then the visits happened and that just kind of solidified everything for us. Okay. You described this as being the <clears throat> meat and potatoes uh, of, of the of PBIS. Do we, if we have this CHAMPS program, do we need PBIS? Yeah, so PBIS is a framework for your entire system, your universal and your targeted and intensive interventions. This is focusing on that tier one classroom management. So this is a component of PBIS that we are just actualizing through CHAMPS. Okay. <clears throat> When I think about uh, support of teachers, and you're, you're, you're saying that this CHAMPS program will be great support for the teachers, correct? When I think of support for the teachers, I think of paras, I think of class size, I think of behavioral therapists. Um, that to me is where we need support in the classroom. I think we can have all the programs in the world, but if we don't have those pieces in there. Um, I spend a lot of time over at Madison. Last year, <clears throat> they had no one to cover their BD room. Okay, so another person had to cover, so that position wasn't covered then. So to me, we have to focus on some of these other areas in order to have the support for the teachers in, in order for them to be successful. Um, the other thing is, <clears throat> would you not say that a student has to be successful and to, to get him, him or her on board with what you're trying to implement, they need to be in the classroom, correct? In order to, okay. Well, our absenteeism is horrible. So how, how are we going to do, you know, get those kids up to speed if they're not there half the time? So another thing you can throw in there if you want to support the teachers is we have to have a truancy officer out getting to the homes, getting after the parents, and getting the kids to school. Otherwise, we're just throwing a lot of money at kids that aren't even there. Um, I think I'll just stop it, stop there. But so again, in my mind, just to summarize, I, I just feel there's a lot of areas that we need to support, and rather than just adding a new program. Thank you. Director Passion, you're right. All of those things are important. I do want to clarify that classroom management is always on the plate of a teacher, and this isn't a program that we're just inserting. We're trying to better refine their skills and build their capacity so they can be more successful and feel more successful. And, and I just might add, it's taking us back to our continuous improvement model when we have that data point with 57% of our referrals coming from the classroom. What um, do we need to do to address that and improve that over time? And one other suggestion I would have, um, so that we don't spread ourselves too thin, you know, maybe have and I'm just throwing this out for an example, just pick two buildings, say uh, an elementary, pick Madison and say smart, and we just focus and we get all the resources we need in there instead of trying to spread ourselves too thin over numerous buildings. So just focus on that and get it right and then use those buildings as a model to move on. Director Palindrome. Um, I have a lot of comments and I have a lot of questions. One, um, the comment was, um, this will build consistency. I wasn't PBIS consistent. The DE report made it sound like it wasn't consistent and it wasn't done with, I hate this word, fidelity. 
Um, so what makes us sure that we're going to do this? The positive I heard was there will be no clipboards as a teacher in the classroom. That drove me nuts. Um, and an autonomy to make it their own. PBIS never gave me autonomy to make my own. Here's your list. Here's your cards. Here's what you follow. Here's how you do it. Here's how you get their attention. So now we're giving them autonomy, or I, so I'm unclear about those things first. I don't know if there's a question. So I guess it's just more my comment. Um, I was also under the understanding that this was a program that was going to Madison, Smart, and Mid City those three comprehensive schools that were, and so now to see others on there, I was like, well, I don't think we really were told that last time. Um, new teachers and new hires, I see where that would be very valuable. Um, my concern is Mid-City was not cited by the DE as a behavior issue. Those kids were respectful, they were, you know, that was not an issue. This seems a very behavior-driven thing. Why are we putting them through this, and I don't mean it through that, but that's not their issue. Sure. Okay, so given that it wasn't in their report, we've been in the conversation with the building leader and want to get the insight from their BSAT team. What do they think? And from the building leader so far, she is interested again because engage, or behavior includes engagement, and that is something that Mid-City is supposed to be working on in their building. So this will really focus on engagement this for them rather than the ha behavior. Having solid classroom management is gonna increase your engagement in the classroom. Willie, will you expand on that please? Yeah, I think there was a slide and I can't recall that that looked at, uh, actually it broke down the, the acronym of where, yes, thank you. And in that, you'll see the structures by which students, I love Cammie, what, what Cammie said earlier, love Cammie too, but what Cammie said earlier <laughs> regarding um, what what are the processes for the learning structure in the classroom? And so um, looking at the conversational piece, how do you engage in the learning? And th that was raised over and over again in that report uh, regarding the engagement in the learning atmosphere. Uh, there was a, there's a lot of sit and get uh, and not not a whole lot of deep level experiences within the educational uh, learning process and so I really like just the the breakdown of the champs definitions of what does learning look like in the classroom and that's the piece that assists the teacher in communicating that so we don't just have a I stand up here and lecture you sit there and repeat back what I just said to you if that makes sense and Karen that kind of gets us to how there will be some things consistent so we want all teachers to think about how will you incorporate movement but you might do it different in your room compared to another teacher or we want all teachers to consider how will students participate in your room we've got to have a way but you can figure out how that looks in your class so there'll be some components that we will do consistently but you'll have the chance to make it the Karen kind your own way um, compared to how another teacher would do that um, my next uh, final thought on this is I would like you to gather the data from these five buildings and next spring bring back to me what the referrals are because before I'm willing to say yep go roll this out with more money behind it to the rest of the buildings I want proof that we did the right thing and this made a difference. Uh, with, uh, but I want evidence is that right, this last year, this was the referrals in these five buildings, and it, in the spring, did it really make a difference? Because I'm not dumping money into something that isn't showing results. And I realize it's only a year of time, but that's got to be enough to show something. Hang on. Director Potts, do you have any questions? Uh, yeah, I guess um, you had commented that you contacted uh, one or two or maybe three districts that have been engaged in this CHAMPS procedures. Uh, were they able to provide you with any before and after stats on its effectiveness? Director Paz, we did not ask for that. We just checked in to see what did they think about it, more 
you know, anecdotal? Were they happy with the trainers? Are they, do they feel like they're getting the bang for their buck? I, I would expand on that. Um, in our conversations with Dr. Burianic, who was the associate superintendent in Sioux City, I believe, she said that this was one of the most important things they did in their district to turn behaviors around. So that was her anecdotal as the associate superintendent of the district before she became the deputy director of learning for the state of Iowa. Sorry, Dr. Murray, but, I'm passing your time. But no stats, just anecdotal. Correct. I do not have stats from her. Okay. okay. The other, the other question I would, it's not a question so much as a, a sort of a help me, help me differentiate. Cause I think, I think we're experiencing some confusion and, and some feeling of cross pollination between champs and PBIS. So would you just one more time go through in for us delineate and differentiate between what their purposes are, where they are congruent and, and where they are not, where they're acute. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And team, if you can add in as you see fit. Um, so PBIS is a framework to bring to life MTSS for SCBH. That's a lot of acronyms. I apologize. Um, and so we have universal tier one, what all kids should receive when we think about their social, emotional well-being. It also in that framework includes what do we do at tier two when we have a percentage of kids who aren't responding to what we're providing them in tier one? What should we be doing? And then a tier three, what do we do for our kids who aren't responding to those additional two layers? CHAMPS is a framework for classroom management. So this would fit into our tier one for PBIS. When we, when we are a teacher and we close our door and we are running our classroom, what is a framework that we should be utilizing to manage behavior within our classroom? So CHAMPS, for our district, what we're proposing, CHAMPS fits into our puzzle at the universal layer. Okay, thank you. Director Beck. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, a couple more questions, um, and and one comment. So, I would have preferred to have some feedback from teachers who've used this system, maybe, or statistics um, from other districts that have used it. Uh, but uh, given that, I do expect to see data after a year of this. And I realize the changes may be small at that point, but we should know if it's a disaster or not, um, or, you know, fantastic, which is what I hope happens um, if this passes. Um, so that's kind of important. Um, I guess I'm also not hearing like, I, I appreciate scaling this down to just a couple schools. I think that's important. Um, and I would be fine if it was just the schools listed or our extended comprehensive schools, but you know, you've got it on five and because you're forward thinking, that's fine. Um, but I guess what I haven't heard is usually what Director Klein Jerome asks, what are teachers not gonna be doing now because they've got, they've got to do some of this professional development. So what, where's the give, right? Because we can't just ask them to do yet one more classroom management thing when there's all these other things we're talking about. Um, and so I guess what are our considerations for making sure there's time? I am not always a fan of the train the trainer model because I feel like things get diluted as they trickle down. And so um, even though that seems to be the recommendation from the state, I worry that it's going to mm -hmm. fade a little bit. And so, um, so I guess what, what are we doing to make sure that there's fidelity and to make sure that our teachers are not overwhelmed with yet one more thing, at least in these buildings? <laughs> 
So I think I have it all. But if I miss something, please let us know, Director Beck and teammates. Please jump in. So um, to clarify, this is not a train the trainer model. Champs does not deploy their uh, professional learning like that. So they will be the ones who have to come in and train our teachers and our staff. Um, as far as overwhelm, just kind of to talk about like classroom management is on the plate of a teacher already, right? So that's never going to come off the plate. What we've identified as a need in these specific buildings is we haven't invested in building that capacity for teachers in a systematic way. So ideally, this will be helpful to them because we as a district in these buildings are saying this is the framework, this is what we're investing in, this is what we're going to support you in. Um, if this were to move forward with your approval, we've already started to play around with the professional learning calendar alongside learning and results of they can't do everything, right? So which days are we going to prioritize where and how can we negotiate that? Um, so those conversations will continue. Um, okay, may so, I add one more thing to that, please? Yeah. Um, it, one of the elephants in the room is that um, we, we talked about the number of referrals that are taking place in the classroom. We talked about um, the fact that there are positions that are unfilled in certain buildings. Um, the buildings that are being identified here are the buildings where the majority of those positions lie unfilled. The number one reason why folks indicate that they are leaving the district, according to the HR information, is related to the issues in the, around classroom management and the things that happen within our classrooms. And so I think it, it is very much connected to, I, my, my gut blurred out response when you said, what will, what will we take off? The, least, the, the less often that they have to engage into classroom discipline things, the more often they're able to instruct and engage in instruction. And so the more that I'm having to send kids out of my classroom to somebody else to manage their behavior because I wasn't able to do it in my classroom <laughs> setting, that increases that load. And so we've learned the less time that I have to spend on discipline, the more time that I can focus on instruction. And so it really does kind of go hand in hand. It's less about what do I take away in order to, I can't get to instruction if I'm spending all day long chasing kids around the room and dealing with those kind of things, so sorry. No, that's fine, and that makes total sense. I was thinking more in terms of the, just getting it in place time. <laughs> I understand that once you have classroom management under control, like that's gonna put a lot of other ducks in a row, and so that makes complete sense. Thank you. Director Klein, Jerome. Um, you already have your staff development calendar planned out. Are these training days on those staff development days? And if so, we're getting a new math curriculum, so you're going to tell an elementary teacher, oh, you have to go to this, and you're not going to go to the staff development on the new math curriculum. That's going to put them over the edge. Mm -hmm. So how do we balance a new curriculum and this? Absolutely. Um, so we have a draft form of what that could look like. And again, that's working alongside learning results of negotiating the time when, because you're right, it all has to happen. And I think the DE, you know, gave us that permission that our comprehensive buildings, we have to differentiate for them. And we know classroom management is needs to be a number one need for them based on what our data is telling us, our teachers are telling us. Um, so we we have it figured out um, and we'll have to continue to work through it but they still will get the math. They will still, they, yeah, they will still deploy the math um, curriculum. But it won't be just building time and an hour here or there or something. I believe we, right now it's drafted that, I'll let Diane speak. <laughs> You're doing a great job though. <laughs> and that's what uh, has worked so well is that partnership in creating all of the integrated professional learning that needs to happen for the upcoming school year. And with that said, knowing how do we make sure that we um, are addressing the overlap that would occur. So there is a document that shows all of the training, who's getting what, when they're getting it, and where the conflicts are. And then when there is a conflict, what is the plan behind that conflict? So that's, uh, you know, the, the, again, beauty of the entire integrated plan is that there is um, the ability to be able to differentiate and make sure that that training that teachers need to be successful uh, will happen at every level.
Director Beck. Sorry, that just reminded me of one more question. So I'm thinking when I go to my assembly day, which is our like PD day before a semester starts, um, oftentimes we will have somebody come in and you know talk to us about X part of learning or we have to do assessment um, on this, that, or the other. And people quickly get overwhelmed because they're like, oh, I have to assess this, 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 and this, and I don't know how to do any of it. And so one thing I've learned is that if you want people to do it, you have to pick a chunk that's small enough for them to, to swallow and tell them, no, nope, just get this part right, and then we'll work on the next part. With this, are people going to come in? Are our, our, our teachers going to feel like, oh my gosh, I have to do all this new stuff in the classroom? Or is it going to be one of those things where we give them the freedom to say, OK, maybe you're pretty comfortable with the movement already. Now you spend time focusing on, I don't know, conversation or what your classroom needs for help. I guess that is sort of another way of asking about the, how do we, I mean, classroom management is part of the job, but how do we not overwhelm them? One piece that we like as we're drafting this proposal and hours spent picking these you know, hours and days apart to make sure that it's respectful as possible of teachers and make it exactly like you're saying. So one thing that we're excited about, minus the new teacher and new hire group, they'll get the two days prior to the school year. Um, but the others, if we do it as, you know, as we're kind of drafting out now, would be they get the one day, then they get some implementation time, and they come back together in September on the in-service day. So then they can kind of reflect. The trainers seem very, with lots of time spent with them and planning these days um, if we're able to move forward. And it would be a lot of reflection, a lot of questioning, a lot of network and then building in the next pieces. So we we're kind of excited about that. I would just also add to uh, the coaching that comes in behind it too. So when you're going through that systemic approach or systematic approach, um, that the leaders are getting that training as well as the coaches, and then it wraps that wraparound support is, is available too. Director Potts, did you have any other questions? No, I do not. Thank you. Any other discussion? Um, I have a couple things. I'll keep mine brief. First, thank you for putting together the presentation. Um, I work in construction. Things change all the time. I totally get that. Uh, and I could see a lot of the board members' uh, points of view, especially uh, with Director Poshin and all the absenteeism. I mean, we know that families have different obstacles and things to get kids to school and things like that. Um, but I think one of the, the biggest things we always hear is classroom management, right? If a kid acts up, it disrupts the whole class and things. And it's nice to hear that um, some things will be put there because, I mean, sometimes it's very overwhelming. Um, I go in and see classrooms and you see that stuff and things like that. I do understand that the kiddos have to be there for that. Uh, I'm surprised that we don't do it in all of the elementaries because that's really, like when you go in the elementary, that's where you get the kids, right? Because they're like, they want to be, it might take a little bit with some, but that's where you get them and then it kind of feeds up into the other stuff. So I'll be curious to see the data after the first year. I feel you'll see more of an impact and a turnover in uh, elementary because they haven't hit puberty yet and all that stuff. And I got four kids. I totally get it. Um, so I'll be very uh, interested to see that data on that. I think that'll be good. But you also have to get the data from the previous years, obviously. And if you could break it down by buildings, because um, obviously if something's working in one where it's not, which I'm sure that's part of your implementation plan. But um, I answered all my own questions. Uh, Again, thank you, Courtney, Lisa, and Cammie uh, for your presentation. Does anyone need any other information? Because I believe this is coming up later. Thank you very much. Board reports, are there any board reports? Director Hayes. 
the board would like to express our condolence to the Gardner Sanders family and the loss of their student this past couple of weeks ago. Thank you. Director Poshin, did you have something? Last Tuesday, I uh, was at Madison Elementary um, in the morning, uh, sitting on uh, um, three classrooms for their summer school program, and I'd like to thank the uh, staff for allowing me to sit in on their um, rooms. Thank you. Are there any other board reports? Seeing none, we'll move on to communications, open forum. Open forum is a time for members of the community to give input at a board meeting regarding school district issues or concerns. Individuals who want to speak, please fill out an open forum request and give it to the board secretary prior to open forum. The form is available in hard copy for in-person attendees or on the school board page of the district's website for those who want to participate virtually. Virtual participants must email their request to Brenda T. at tbren at davenportschools.org by 3 p.m. on the day of the board meeting. The board will not act on any issue presented during open forum if it was not published as an agenda item. Iowa Open Meetings Law prohibits action on any issue that is not on the agenda. The president may set the amount of time allowed for individuals to speak. The board asks that no charges or complaints be made against individual employees of the district or community. Remarks that reflect negatively on the character or motives of any person will be called out of order. You will be asked to state your name and home address prior to making remarks. I believe we did not have any virtual open forum requests, okay? We did have three, Sergeant Quick, could you please look out in the hallway and see if the two gentlemen are out there at all? I do believe they probably left. Thank you, sir. Uh, so we have one, and it is Richard Thomas. So if you wanna step up to the podium, push the button and state your name, uh, two minutes. Hello, um, I'm Richard Thomas, graduated from West in 69, graduated from Marycrest in 98. I have a math degree in secondary ed, retired from the Corps of Engineers after 32 years, and I substituted here in the district for 10 years. I'm sorry. Hey, sir, hang on one second. Am I doing something wrong? No, 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 no. You picked this at the end. Yeah. No, that's at the end. Oh. <laughs> you started Okay, okay, well, hey, that was a warm up. <laughs> Correction, there were no open forum requests. I should have verified that before I read the long spiel. Uh, we will move on to the consent agenda. May I have a motion? Mr. Mr. President? President. Whoa, who got that one quicker? Uh, Director Beck. I'm just trying to move the meeting along. Um, <laughs> I move the consent agenda be approved as written. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, I will call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Ayes have it, motion carries. Uh, superintendent report. None at this time. Committee reports. Uh, data wall ad hoc committee. Nothing to report at this time. Finance committee. Well, <clears throat> we met last Thursday and Kevin is going to present after all. Do you want to do those now? Okay, um, Ivy, we'll start with the monthly report, the second one. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Brenda's not here, we're a little out of sorts. Sorry. But Ivy was ready. 
She was going to, yeah, see her? She had her finger on the buzzer. You're doing great, Ivy. Uh, no report from legislative advocacy. Is there anything from Elziac? Okay. Uh, long range facilities planning. We have not met. Policy committee. Nope. No report. All right. Now, Kevin, you may do the financial report. Okay, so we're going to start with a monthly report. Um, one of the things I did on, on this one, this is through the, through the month of May. June tends to be a month that is not a normal month because we get to the end of the year and we get a lot of accruals put in. Um, so this will be the last report until we get done with our certified annual report on September 15th. Um, so this is the 11 months ended May. Um, the thing that I really took a deep dive into was the federal revenues and the federal expendi expenditures. You'll notice at the top, just on the federal revenues, I didn't highlight any of the numbers this time because there's they seem to be pretty well in line. Of There's no anomalies or reasons why. But we do have an increase of federal revenues by $4.5 million from FY23 compared to FY22. But on the lower half of that page, on the expenditure side, I just wanted to give you a feel for what's different between each of those that have significant differences um, for federal revenues on salaries for example we actually have um, a lower total salaries year to date compared to last year part of that is due to federal federal expenditures if you remember last year we had the governor's payment of just over a million dollars I believe um, through ESSER funds that was in last fiscal year. We don't have that this fiscal year. So part of that is we had a half a million dollar decrease in federal salaries as a total. Other federal programs could have an impact, but ESSER kind of leads the way. But others like Title I might have some timing issues, but primarily it's driven by ESSER funds. In the benefits, we spent $100,000 more in, in benefits due to federal funds. Purchase services is interesting because we are um, significantly higher, but 3.4 million of that is due to ESSER funds specifically. Um, that's where we um, would have some partners that we've used ESSER funds for primarily. Supplies and material were a million dollars more in ESSER funds, and property were a half a million dollars more in ESSER funds and federal funds combined. The other objects is in material, but just kind of ran down that very quickly to, to say how is how much is it different for federal funding. Um, the, the other important part is um, that I mentioned to the committee is every month I always talk about how far in arrears the state is from reimbursing us for federal funds. It's pretty much a dead heat. Last year, we were $3.8 million behind through the month of May of our payment. They get caught up in July, sometimes in June. Um, this year it was $3.7 million behind. If you remember the prior months, when you're closer to the end of the quarter, it was much higher. It was in the $6 million range. We got our quarter payment, so it brought it back down. That number will go up at the end of June, but we'll be able to account for that since we're accruing those um, revenues for that for that month um, any questions on that I went very quickly through that but I just wanted to give you a feel for what federal funds are doing as always Kevin knocked it out of the park I'll go to the uh, key measures report next um, this is interesting. It's not concerning, but it's interesting that you'll notice our um, UAB is climbing. It's almost doubled from FY22 to what's projected in FY23. Um, a large portion of that is due to filling vacancies, but it's also t um, plays into the effect of how we're spending our dollars. Um, when you look, when you look at our, we always talk about leveling of our expenditures and our revenue. You'll see that our UAB is at 86.1% of our spend. We're, 
we wanted that to be closer to 100% so we can level out our UAB. Um, that's growing, and it has the same effect on our solvency. You'll see that that has ballooned to an estimated of 31%, which is much higher than the, the range that they're looking for. Um, that will be self-correcting when we get into next year. If you remember, we had to lower our levy next year, and the primary reason for lowering the levy, we had to lower our cash reserve. That is in direct relationship to our growing solvency ratio that you see on this report on that third set of boxes. So this will self-correct itself. It's not unexpected to, to balloon at this point in time. And then if you go to the bottom of the page, um, on page two, that is where we're at of our projected versus um, our certified budget that we're in line with all four of those categories. Um, obviously, we have one month to go, so hopefully there's not a lot of other ex other things in that uh, non-instructional program, so, but we're running pretty close there. Um, but we're still within budget and within budget in total. Any questions on key measures? Director Kleinger. Um, since we won't be getting a, a July update on this because you're wrapping up June, um, could we get an update in July about the auditor citations and what we've addressed and where we're at? And Absolutely. So, yes. You. Any other questions? Director Potts, do you have any questions? No. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin, for your presentation. Uh, we will move on to items requiring action. Uh, may I have a motion on subject 10.01 Bluegrass parking lot project? Mr. President. President. I think she got you. No, just yeah. see. Yeah. Uh, is, there, uh, is there a second? There's no motion. Huh? Oh, Director Poston, I'm sorry. Move the board approve Taylor Ridge paving and construction to complete the bluegrass parking lot repairs in the amount of seventy-four thousand fifteen dollars. Second. Is there a second? Thank you, Director Kleinger. <laughs> Is there any discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Eyes have it, motion carries. May I have a motion on subject 10.02, English Learner Program Newcomer Curriculum Adoption? Mr. President. Director Beck. I move the board approve the, approve the purchase of the six-year newcomer curriculum adoption from Vista Higher Learning in the amount of $99,179.75. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, I will call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Ayes have it, motion carries. May I have a motion on subject 10.03 ELA preschool curriculum purchase? Mr. President. Director Beck. I move the board approve the purchase of the preschool creative curriculum from Teaching Strategies for Early Childhood in the total amount of $226,265 for a soft rollout starting in the 2023-24 school year. Thank you, is there a second? Second. Motion's been moved and seconded, any discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Ayes have it, motion carries. May I have a motion on subject 10.04 elementary ELA curriculum field test amplify core knowledge language arts? Mr. President. Director Beck. I move the board approve the purchase of elementary ELA curriculum field test materials from amplify core knowledge language arts in the total amount of $194,570.88 for the 2024-25 school year. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Motion's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Director Beck. Um, I noticed in um, the report from, I think it was Madison, that this is one of the things that the DOE was willing to
provide material support for? So is this price including what we're getting from them or are we are we going to take advantage of that? <laughs> I guess is my question. We will be taking advantage of the whatever the Department of Ed will offer us. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. And it, it may be reimbursement then, I guess. Okay. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? Seeing none, I will call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Ayes have it. Motion carries. May I have a motion on subject 10.05, curriculum adoption for personal wellness? Mr. President. Director Beck. I move the board approve the purchase of curriculum resources for personal wellness at West High School for $86,070 from Johnson Wellness and Fitness using ESSER funding. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Motion's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Ayes have it. Motion carries. May I have a motion on subject 10.06, curriculum adoption for career exploration? Mr. President. Director Postum. Move the board approve the purchase of intermediate career exploration curriculum resources from eDynamic -Dyna Learning for 245000 using ESSER funding. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Motion's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Ayes have it. Motion carries. May I have a motion on subject 10.07, curriculum adoption for 7 to 12 health? Mr. President. Director Beck. I move the board approve the purchase of 7 through 12 health curriculum resources for $123,632.50 from Goodhart Wilcox Publishers using ESSER funding. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Motion's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Ayes have it. Motion carries. May I have a motion on subject 10.08, screencastify renewal? Mr. President. Director Beck. I move the board approve the annual renewal of screencastify in the total amount of $26,643 for the 2023-24 school year. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Ayes have it. Motion carries. May I have a motion on subject 10.09, Wonders License Renewal? Mr. President. Director Beck. I move the board approve the one-year license renewal of the Wonders Student and Teacher License with McGraw-Hill in the amount of $132,227.85 for the 23-24 school year. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Motion's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Ayes have it. Motion carries. May I have a motion on subject 10.10, .10, Lexia subscri subscription renewal? Mr. President. Director Beck. I move the board approve the annual renewal of the Lexia subscription in the total amount of $132,600 for the 23-24 school year. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Motion's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, I will call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Ayes have it. Motion carries. May I have a motion on subject 10.11, renewal of a membership in rural school advocates of Iowa? Mr. President. Director Beck. I move the board approve continued membership in the rural school advocates of Iowa for an annual fee of $750. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Motion's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, I will call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. 
ayes have it motion carries may i have a motion on subject 10.12 transfer of funds mr president director posture move the board approve the fund transfers from esser in the general fund to save pebble food and nutrition oost and self-insurance funds in the amounts of four hundred and forty three thousand six hundred and sixty eight dollars and twenty two cents three million one hundred and eighty six thousand seven hundred and twenty dollars one hundred and seventy two thousand eight hundred sixty five dollars and thirty cents ten thousand dollars five hundred and sixty nine dollars and nine cents four thousand five hundred and thirty three dollars and thirty two cents respectively and from food and nutrition fund to the general fund for $321,657.79 for overhead and custodial services. Thank you, is there a second? Second. Motion's been moved and seconded, is there any discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign? Ayes have it, motion carries. Uh, may I have a motion on subject 10.13, CHAMPS? Mr. President. Director klein -Jerome. I move the board approve the contract with Safe and Civil Schools for fiscal year 2023-24 CHAMPS professional learning for 57500 plus travel. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Motion's been moved and second. Is there any discussion? Uh, Director Postum. So I've, I've given this a lot of thought and I am going to vote for this But if we don't give the uh, teachers the support they need as far as what I mentioned earlier in class size um, uh, Behavioral therapists um, paras working on a absenteeism If not none of that is put in place, then I feel that this will be doomed for uh, failure and it will be a waste of our money Is there any other discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Ayes have it, motion carries. We're gonna take a five minute break before we go on to discussion items.
All right, we're back. We will move on to discussion items. Uh, first subject for discussion is 11.01 uh, for Terracon for the West High HVAC ESSER abatement project. I'll turn it over to Superintendent. Josh? Uh, we need to hire a professional um, service to oversee the removal and abatement of con or, uh, asbestos at West High School. Um, there are a ton of steam pipes in our building that have asbestos in them. And when we do the West uh, Esser project, we need to remove those uh, along with that project. Um, Terracon is a uh, professional in the service. We obviously hire them with our contracted service throughout the year anyway. Um, so they know our buildings very well. Um, they will be there throughout the project to make sure that we're disposing of and um, removing the asbestos in the proper manner to keep all the staff and um, students safe. Uh, so the last thing we want is to expose people who shouldn't be exposed to it. So uh, I'm just bringing this forward to discuss the possibility of hiring them for our professional service. Any questions? Uh, Director Poshton. So explain to me, compensated on a lump sum basis, the ninety-five thousand. They'll they'll bill us one time for the project. They'll do the project within ninety days, and then they'll send us one bill for it. Okay, then t tell me how they arrived that that figure. I can't tell you because I don't know um, the inner workings of their company. But so basically, we're going to pay them whatever they they're going to charge us. The, they're a professional service, so their fees are a little higher than normal, but um, I, I wouldn't just say we're going to pay them what we have to, but by law, I think we have to hire somebody to do this type of job. So this is kind of like hiring an architect to tear a building down. Very much similar, yes. Uh, Director Beck. Yeah, I think... That's getting at my question. So we have to hire somebody to figure out how to do it safely, and then the budget for removal is separate. The actual yes. removal based on their plans. And yep. are they the, the only company that does this? Uh, there are other companies that do that. Terracon's already working within our system and kind of knows our school buildings, our staff, and how to go about the, the system. So my, the other way you could go about that, it would be somebody coming in and starting over brand new again. Okay. All right, I have a couple questions, obviously. And this is right in my wheelhouse. Um, will they be doing the abatement to where they're just putting the plan together on you're going to need this many glove bags? Um, are they abating the asbestos off the pipe, the pipe stand? Are they cutting sections of the pipe out with it on it, leaving it in the bag and, and hauling it? They're the ones making the plan. They're, I believe, not doing the doing the work itself. There'll be another contractor hired to do the actual removal. So they're the ones that are planning, supervising, organizing the removal. Um, I haven't seen plans of exactly what they're going to do this to this degree yet, how they're going to go about removing it. But that is a good example of how they would go about it. And for HVAC facilities, are probably like six inch and above pipes. I'm assuming. Uh, I probably said steam lines so steam. High 12. Yeah, depending on the location. Over 16. Um, so usually on an abatement project for everyone, you have to have a supervisor with a supervisor card. You have to have a person with an abatement card. You cannot do it without a supervisor there. Um, and then you have to test the air quality and all this stuff. But I don't understand why we have to have a one company do it that's not doing the work and just not is it all state law or something that you can send us where it mandates in that because i normally the company that does it does it. they do the you know the whole thing i think they're they're planning to put it out for a bid or to see if a contractor can do it cheaper than them to save us money but they're planning to oversee it potentially they could end up being the ones doing it but i think it has to do with how much the bids come back to do the project so they're, they're creating the plans right now and others are going to come back and bid the project to see who can do it for our estimated amount or less. Do you know how much footage of piping they're talking about? 
I saw the number once, but I don't remember it off the top of my head. Okay. Because it depends on how big the pipe is. If it's a big pipe, you can only do about a three-foot section at a time. That's why I asked if they were going to – because if they do the whole pipe, they can encapsulate the whole pipe, cut a huge section out, and get it out. And I realize it's a, a special cost to get rid of it because it has to be a, a special – just for the reason the cost, you have to line the complete dumpster and seal it up and everything. Um, and kind of along the lines with Director Koch, and I think some of this stuff is stupid that we have to do, and I realize some of it is state requirements, and everything looks great from Des Moines, but, you know, not here. Um, so if you could get something to reference on that, on why we have to do it this way, and the company that does it just can't have, hey, this is our plan, this is what we're doing, da 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 da, da. And yep. I'm assuming they'll tan off the area, and then they're going to have to have a way to get it out of the building to get, a, you know, keep it the furthest away from folks so yeah the, the majority of the work will be in the basement of west so okay and should be a set up shower stations and everything yeah, i'm sure i'm sure there'll be a lot of stuff set up for them yeah. the best is we can get this removed so that the contractors don't have to work around it okay yeah if you can get some of that information before we have to vote on i would appreciate it yep is there any other discussion director potts do you have anything i do not is there any other information that any board member would need? Um, you'll bring this back at the next regular meeting? Yes. Okay. All right, seeing none, we will move on to the next discussion item, 11.02, the natural gas contract. I'll turn it back over to the superintendent. Josh. All right, so uh, we currently uh, get our natural gas for the entire school district through Mid-American Energy Services. Yeah, it's not the actual energy like we think of getting Mid-American Energy. They have another branch or a business line called Services at the end of it. Um, and we have had a contract with them, I believe, going on around five years. Uh, they're going to be ending uh, doing that type of work through the delivery of pipelines for um, commercial or larger customers. So I've, I've started to reach out to other suppliers of natural gas. So Mid-American Energy will still have the, the lines themselves, but we buy in such bulk that um, we go through a company that goes out and purchases it um, in different amounts at the right time to keep our costs low. Um, I'm not an exact natural gas purchasing expert, but I did bring somebody online here. Her name's Athena Simpson, um, who... Um, can kind of give an example or give a little bit of a presentation or a discussion over a couple different options we have to purchase natural gas. So, Athena, are you online? I am. Can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Hello, I'm Athena. I'm with Wood River Energy. Uh, what Josh said is correct in that you are currently working through a third-party natural gas supplier. Wood River is also a third-party natural gas supplier. We work directly with Mid-American Energy, the utility, on a program that allows commercial and industrial customers to select who they purchase their natural gas through. By doing that, it gives you control over your costs. There's a couple of different options um, that we can kind of talk about here that are on your screen that can provide the district with protection from the market volatility that we've seen, provide budget certainty and really make um, your life easier from a budget standpoint and know what to plan for as far as natural gas costs go. You guys are coming off of a contract that has an extraordinarily low price. The market has changed significantly in the last couple of years. Um, very volatile. Uh, costs are increased for a number of reasons, kind of like everything. Um, but we're becoming more of a global market. We're competing domestically for gas here that we would traditionally get to keep, but is now being shipped overseas because European gas is trading for so much higher than we are here in the U.S. And, and really, we just continue to see these increased costs and volatility. Right now is a great time to be looking at this because we've seen um, some costs right in the market that we have not been able to secure or see uh, for about 18 months. Uh, specifically through calendar year 22, we were on a rocket ship upward bound for the entirety of the year. Um, then in January, we had a culmination of a number of things happen that allowed us to kind of settle back down into some lower costs. Uh, 
one of the warmest winters we've seen here in the U.S. and worldwide in over 100 years. We had a large export facility that was offline all winter long that allowed us to keep some additional gas here domestically. Uh, and some things that really just kind of help soften those costs that provide an opportunity for people looking to secure their budget, uh, whether it be short term or long term. So with that, a couple of the options to talk about that Wood River offers. These are all options that would limit exposure of any type of market volatility to the school district. Um, that first column there is our price protection program. It's a Wood River managed price where we are using all of the tools at our disposal. Uh, calls, puts, hedges, callers, all the things that we have, pooling your use with hundreds, if not a thousand or more customers here in Iowa to purchase gas for a period of time and really kind of level out those peaks and valleys of the natural gas market that happens throughout the years and try to keep those costs consistent. There's no guarantee to that program of what those costs will be, but we have made decisions in that program for a period of the next five winters in preparation for these things. We're making decisions around that program when markets allow, never under duress. We are continually reviewing that. There's a team of us here at Wood River um, reviewing that each month, saying what makes sense? Do we need to hedge gas? Do we look good? All of those things. With the price protection program, we would be able to service district meters that qualify for transport. District meters do need to use a certain amount of gas to qualify under traditional natural gas transport programs. But we would be willing to be bill agent on all of the other district meters just so we could combine all of your bills into one single bill for the district. Uh, the next column talks about a guaranteed fixed price option. This is a true guaranteed pricing option where your price is your price is your price. There's no contractual volumes per month. We go out and we buy that gas at that time and you're locked into that rate for whatever that term you've agreed upon is. One year, three year, five year, um, that is your cost for the entirety of that term. Those costs don't change. The only time that would change if there, if there was some massive force majeure type event upstream where we physically could not get gas. Um, but beyond that, again, your price is your price. You're not exposed to daily volatility in the markets. You're not exposed to the utility calling critical or penalty type of options in the markets. And you really allows you to build a budget around that number, knowing what your traditional volumes are within the year. Questions okay. on either of those two? Yep. Can you explain or if we've ever seen a, uh, a force majeure for the guaranteed fixed price in the past? Okay. So in February of 21, um, there were a number of suppliers in the market that called force majeure, although it was not a true force majeure. Wood River did not. We were able to deliver gas to all of our customers throughout the Midwest and Rocky Mountain region, even though those market costs through that event ran as high as $1,000 a decatherm through that President's Day weekend. We held those costs. Those people that had a $4, $5, $3 guaranteed fixed price, that was the cost they saw on their invoice. They saw no more. Also kind of leads into the local government risk pool option. And I guess before I get into that, are there any questions on those two programs? Um, I do have one question. What is our current, like the in the middle column, the one year, first year rate is 515 for gas. What are we currently paying for gas? Josh, do you have that? Otherwise, I do. I believe it's somewhere in the round, around $4 a decatherm. So... It's a, it's a measurement of gas. It's called decatherms. So uh, right now it's quite a bit lower than what we're paying right now. But because when we, we did the contract years ago, the natural gas prices were like rock bottom and the timing was good. Um, and as she said before, uh, the, the timing actually is pretty good for us to purchase some natural gas right now. The prices have come back down a little bit, but not as far as they were back in before 2020. Um, yeah. And these prices change all the time. So these are prices that I got on the day we put this presentation or this, this paper together, but they change every single day. So when we come to have an approval of the document for an amount, if we were to do it, to do it this way, um, the dollar amounts will be different than they are today. 
So it's a real fluid market. It changes every day, every hour. And we're just, we're just monitoring it and, and trying to set ourselves up for down the road. And Mid-American Energy Services is no longer an option. They are going to back out of that type of service, yeah. Okay. Great question. Any other questions on those two types of programs? Or I guess natural gas transport in general. <laughs> No. Okay. Yeah, so that third column. Oh, sure. Hang on a second. Sorry. Um, it took me a second to push the button. Um, the fixed price one on the side there. Um, mm -hmm. So, how would that compare? I don't know, Josh, if you know this, but like, if we were to take the average amount we've consumed in the last couple of years, the number of therms, would it come close to that? Would it exceed that? So you're talking the one for this to the right, that full dollar amount to the right. Mm -hmm. So that's the next option she's going to talk about. But I believe up to this date, we spent about $100,000 less than that amount this okay. year. But that's on the $4 per therm. Yeah, it's it's the lesser of the amounts that we okay. had in the past. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So with that, if there's other questions, I'm happy to answer, or we can talk about that third column there. So the third column talks about the Iowa Local Government Risk Pool for natural gas. This program was formed in 2019 after uh, an extreme weather event happened late in the, the budget year for school districts that kind of threw things out of whack. A group of superintendents approached ISPIS and said, how do we avoid this from happening? We want budget certainty on this natural gas. Uh, because of the way school funds work, there's not a ton of flexibility in where you're able to pay things from or just coming up with extra money if, if one of those large cost type events happen. So a number of years went into work uh, to build a program that works specifically for school finance and can provide you full budget certainty for your natural gas costs. So with that, it's the Iowa Local Government Risk Pool. We currently service about 145 Iowa districts within the pool ranging in size from my home district of Montezuma, itty bitty, all the way up to Sioux City and everywhere in between. The Iowa Local Government Risk Pool is a 28E agreement amongst school districts overseen by a board of peer superintendents where districts pay a one time per year lump sum premium payment. That payment covers all of your natural gas costs for the entire year commodity, utility distribution, fees and taxes, everything is lumped into that single number, making your finance office uh, very happy and having one single number as they build their budget each year of knowing, here's what my natural gas costs will be for the year. This is the most that they will be, okay? Uh, the way that that number is set, we review your natural gas usage history, take a look at weather patterns, construction, anything major that's happened that maybe has affected that and say, what can we secure this gas for today? Commodity cost and all utility costs are a straight pass through. Then there's a 25% risk premium adder applied. This formula is consistent across the entire pool. It is set by that board of peer superintendents and that risk premium adder ensures the district against cost swings, weather swings, usage swings, full insurance against any of those types of events that can affect your natural gas budget. The only time that number would change is if you had massive construction, uh, entire new HVAC or boiler systems, opening and closing of a building, something significant within your physical plan. Otherwise, you have a known number that this is the most you'll pay for the entire year for your natural gas. You cut that check when your new budget year rolls in, July 1 or close to, and then you don't pay a bill for the entire year. Your gas costs are covered. On the tail end of each year, uh, we do put reporting together showing you here was the district's planned usage, here was your actual usage, and then the overall pool performance as a whole and where costs came in. Then you have the protection on the tail end as well that we as service providers are limited in underwriting profits. We're capped at 20%. If we exceed that, we're issuing refunds back to the districts. Uh, and, and you know that here's the most you'll pay, but you also have that protection on the tail end. What makes this program 
uh, a true risk transfer program, which is one of the reasons it can be paid from management funds if you choose. You have your one-time risk premium uh, budget, and then you're, we're moving all of that risk away from the district onto us as service providers. So we're absorbing all of that uh, usage volatility that comes with weather, tariff changes that are happening within the utility and the pipelines, crazy things that are happening in the market. You have zero exposure to those things. And so you, you pay your premium. It is set independent year to year. Each year we try to have those up to districts by the 1st of March. That way, as you're building your budget, you have a known input. And then those profits and losses in any given year do not transfer year to year. So unlike a traditional insurance program, if we take a loss in any given year, we do not penalize you. We cannot penalize you the following year. That cost is set independent with where the market is during that time. Uh, there is no rollover of those profits and losses. They're wholly siloed year to year, which makes it a true risk transfer program away from districts. Questions on any of that? So part of the reason I bought, I brought uh, Wood River here to talk about this is because they are the ones in the state of Iowa that offer the Iowa local government uh, risk pool option. There are other companies that sell natural gas similar ways to they do with their with their price protection option and their guaranteed fixed price. Um, but uh, they're the one company in the state that offers this um, risk pool option. So um, I've talked to other companies. I've dealt with this a little bit in the past. So we've, I've, I've been with different organizations that have purchased gas this way. And, you know, I, I think a few years back, Texas saw some issues with um, freezing down there and we had some natural gas line issues and there was districts that saw a one month gas bill that was the size of their annual bill and they had to figure out how to pay for it. Um, I don't obviously want to see that for our district. I'm trying to think of ways to eliminate risk like that. Um, so I thought the, the lo local government risk pool option was kind of an intriguing way to look at this. I think that that secondary thought about the management fund option being there if we needed to um, pay for it that way. We could we could utilize that if we had to, if the the general funds were getting tight. So yeah. Any questions? Um, if we took the five dollar and fifteen cent cost and multiplied it by what our current use has been this last year. Would we come to that five hundred and sixty-eight thousand five hundred and ten dollars? Would that be higher or lower? It would be lower. The five fifteen for the gas would be lower. Lower than the five sixty-eight. Yes. Okay. So the five sixty-eight is inclusive, though, of all of your utility distribution costs, your meter fees, your taxes, all of those extra fees. Uh, so just to kind of make that the the, the five fifteen is literally gas. And then we pass all those gas costs directly through to you. And then your usage is built out exactly as you use. Whereas the 568 is inclusive of all of the gas costs that you see each month uh, from the utility. And then you are billed just that flat number. So if your usage is higher than anticipated, you're not impacted. Um, and so that's one of the key differences between the two. And I'm assuming our neighboring districts are in the same situation. They probably were with Mid-American Energy Services. Do you have any idea what they're doing to address um, it? I, a number of them, I don't know if they were with Mid-American Energy Services, but there were some with, but I know some have already switched to this risk pool option. Uh, I think you could probably speak to it better, but um, I know Bettendorf uh, switched to this, I believe last year. Um, mm -hmm. Muscatine's already doing it. DeWitt's already doing it. So the, the local a couple of the local districts here are already doing it. I think are there any other ones that I'm missing? Um, Comanche. Comanche. Um, and then, yeah, we've got, I don't know if you guys can see the map back there, all that green. <laughs> you cut off for a second uh, there. Oh, all of the, the green on my map. <laughs> oh, sure. On the other yeah. document. Yep, yep. So, uh, yeah, we've got 145 Iowa districts ranging, like I said, all across the state. Um, but yeah, Bettendorf has now been in for a full year uh, in the pool. So a neighbor of 
not similar size, but you know, in your region. Yeah. And one last question, uh, you know, this is pretty foreign to me on all of this. So if you were gonna make a recommendation, Josh, would you go with the guaranteed fix rate or the risk pool? Right now with all the uncertainty going on around um, the country and the state for numerous reasons, my recommendation would be to go to the risk pool. Um, at least in our state of affairs, we can guarantee what our costs are gonna be somewhere. And if we end up in a bind later on with the general fund, which I hope we don't, I don't believe we will, but we also have the option to, to go into the management fund if needed. Thank you. Director Costin. Josh, you said this 568,000 was about 100,000 more than what we currently had for this past year? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's where, where our bills are at right now. Yeah. Okay. So for 12 months, that's a little over 8,000. So I would agree with you that um, I think with everything going on in, in the world right now, that that would be the safest bet to go. Thank you. Director Potts, did you have any questions? No, I, I've been listening intently and, you know, so long as the attitude in Washington, D.C. is anti-fossil fuels, we need to try to cover our butts. Because we're not going to heat our buildings with wind. Interesting time to be an energy. <laughs> When does the deal with Mid America run out? Because I mean, the, we're going to have a meeting after July first, and I believe this is for July first. Is um, I think it sounded like they would retro it back, but do we need to do this for the next school year? And that's why you brought it up to us. Or? Yeah. So the contract I believe is up around October. Is that or anything? I think we talked about this. Yep. I have the end of September. So of September. just a couple of things. If the district chose to enroll. We could do out of July 1. There would just be a short-term extra step uh, in there for your business office. So you could enroll out of July 1. Honestly, that would probably be cleanest if that works for the district and it's something you're interested in. We would honor that existing contract that you have in place through the term of it. And then Wood River would be able to take over supply at that point. I don't think we're too worried about the couple of days of gas usage during that time frame. We'll probably what I'm going to do is bring it recommended, bring it forward in July for approval, and we'll send off the the letter to Mid American, making sure our contract is ended correctly in the legal legal way, and we'll bring it forward for a recommendation to join the risk pool, probably at the next meeting. Okay, so if the board takes action on that, and that's the route that the board goes, when will we start taking from Wood River? I mean. Because if we're in October or whatever, when the one ends, then I don't expect to pay for a whole year, July 1 to June 30th. It should be a prorated thing is what I'm getting at. Yep. We will talk about so it. We've really. got a couple of options there. Yeah. you. We've worked with a number of districts in the same situation. What that does in the short term, there's an extra step for your business office where you will still receive those Mid-American Energy Services invoices through that term. You'll pay them directly and then you'll submit a copy to Wood River for full reimbursement. So you'll have a net zero for that and then you would pay those program fees in full. So, and that would just be in the short term and that way you could participate for the entire year uh, with, with that cost listed there or whatever the updated cost is at that time. And that would just be until through September production. Make sure you really detail note that in the minutes, Ivy. We got her on record. <laughs> <laughs> We've done it with lots of districts. So we try to make it super smooth and simple. Um, try to make the whole transition super easy um, so that you guys don't have to do a ton of work for it. So. So, Josh, this means I will not be sitting here at a board meeting freezing because we've turned the thermostat down. Is that yeah. correct? And Jamie will no longer be cold. <laughs> No, we're always warm here, so we're good. 
Is there any other information or anything else the board would like to see before this comes to us the next regular meeting in July? I don't know the date right off the top of my head, but um, all right. Thank you, Josh. Thank you. Uh, the next subject for discussion is 11.03 DCSD core diploma. I will turn it back over to the superintendent. Thank you. One of the things that we uh, would like to put in front of the school board tonight is the idea of a core diploma. We have many seniors that arrive into the second part of their senior year who are too far away from credits to to graduate, the Davenport Community School District has a very high standard, which is above the state requirement. Um, but our goal is to make sure that our students uh, in our school district are achieving that high standard. And we have a pocket of students that um, are, are deciding to walk away from school that, that could actually attain a diploma following the state levels uh, that are set by the Department of Education. So tonight we want to present an idea to you. The reason why we're presenting this uh, so soon is we're really working hard at a comprehensive at-risk plan for the Davenport Community School District. But this is something that we believe that can help students immediately. Um, we have students that fall into this pathway. Um, so to get this going right away, we think could really benefit some students that are on the cusp of graduating. Um, and, and we want to, we, we want to make sure that we're describing this very clearly and the board has enough information and questions to ask because we're not building a pathway to an easier diploma. That's what we're not doing tonight. But what we're doing is, build, is giving an opportunity for students who find themselves in their second half of their, in that, in that part of their senior year where we can put some, some students uh, into the workforce and, and onto uh, programs, um, uh, community college, things of that nature. So I'll turn it over to our wonderful learning and results team. And as always, Cabinet, feel free to chime in. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for taking the opportunity to uh, review the core diploma proposal and, and the concept of uh, the core diploma. And this, as TJ mentioned, is, is intended for seniors who meet the state requirements and are not um, getting the electives in that are, are needed. And if the electives are the barrier, we're, we're looking at ways that we can remove those barriers so students can be successful and be ready to move on. This is um, not something that we would in start discussing with students at uh, freshman, sophomore, junior, um, year it, it is intended truly for that senior year uh, where students just have not uh, where they're ready to graduate they've met the core requirements and it's the electives or those classes that um, are above and beyond the state requirements there are multiple other districts that have done um, have used a core diploma as an option and have found success within within that too we did take a look at just some preliminary numbers from this year, and there were 100, 113 seniors uh, that did not graduate that will be coming back. And out of those, um, not, not all of them, just to be clear, would qualify for this because you still have to meet those requirements that are there within the English language arts, uh, the math credits, uh, science, social studies, health education, uh, the physical education requirements, and then financial literacy is not required, but it is one that we do feel is very important for students to be able to take and be successful in the future. And then again, um, one elective is what we put in, in the recommendation for that. So students would be earning 17 credits, uh, 17 units of credit uh, that would be required for that core diploma. The 113 students, again, that's just from this past year, um, and 81 of those were at that 17 minimum credit. Now that's not doing a crosswalk of their transcripts. So of those 81, we would have to dig into their transcripts to determine whether they met the required courses within the core diploma. But that just gives you a number of the impact there. 
it also um, addresses the electives, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that are required for students to take. And it really just uh, focuses in on the ones that the students need and opens those um, pathways or the, the doorway for students to, to move on to their post-secondary success. It uh, is not a way that we are looking at reducing the rigor. Um, the required courses are still there and expectations uh, to meet those, those core requirements are, are intact. We do know that students have many challenges. Um, you, we could just walk into any high school and be sitting in a room to really learn the story because each of these numbers, it is just a number, but what's behind that number is a student with a story. And what we want to do is be able to honor and provide that level of respect of the challenges and the barriers that are there uh, so that students can move on uh, to that next, uh, next level of their life for success. So I want to, is there anything else, Allie, that you would like to? Allie's been instrumental in being able to um, co-create the proposal and be able to bring a wealth of knowledge and background to. I just really want to re-emphasize that this is not a pathway to early graduation, and we would obviously be emphasizing the need for electives um, all along the way. As, as most of you know, most of my areas that I'm responsible for are electives, and we did keep an elective credit in there with the idea that we do want students still um, to explore what they want to be doing next and still have that opportunity um, to take. I mean, I'm going to always advocate for CTE classes, you know me now. Um, so being able to take those classes that will lead to a more meaningful career after high school. Um, so we didn't take them away completely, we just reduced them. Director Klein, Jerome. Um, I heard that with this core diploma, they could, you know, go to the workforce, go to community college. I didn't hear, would Iowa State, Iowa, UNI accept them with a core diploma? Does their diploma say something different than a regular Davenport school diploma? We're looking into all those, those areas. We do know that, um, with some of the districts, the core diploma does not look different, uh, but we would want to verify that and really uh, intentionally have the Davenport uh, diploma. Um, make we make sure that we're in line with what's required. So, and a state university would accept this. That's a. I will write that question not, down. Okay. Mm -hmm. We did check into the community college, and that does um, accept a core diploma. And then we had the question of follow up with military to make sure that we did we weren't closing doors. You know, we definitely want to make sure that we're not doing anything um, that would limit any opportunities. So, um, military was another one that we looked at. Mm -hmm. Thank Correct. You. Thank you, mm -hmm. Director Beck. Um, yeah, uh, I think speaking from the community college perspective, the idea is that anybody can go to community college. So basically I can see this being sort of, sort of like in between a GED and a full high school diploma. Um, I like the idea to, um, remove some of these barriers. I would want it to look different <coughs> than the standard diploma. Um, and I would have issues potentially, I would, I would want it to look different somehow because I don't think these students, if this is what you're doing, you're not going to be prepared to succeed at a University of Iowa or something like that. And I don't want to set them up for failure. Right. Um, and so I think if it looks different somehow, then that might help people figure out their best path forward. Um, I don't, you know, I just, I don't want to, I don't want to close doors, as you said, set people up for failure. Um, and I think I would want to make sure that students don't just shoot for the minimum and do barely anything. And so that they find themselves in this position, their fourth semester of senior year or fourth term of senior year, because this is not, as you said, an alternative pathway to graduation. It is a, I don't know what to call it, but <laughs> um, so 
I don't know the best way to go about doing that, but I would not want to see people aiming for this, which is the other reason I think it should look distinctly different than our typical diploma. One of, one of the things that I would add is that as kids enter as freshmen, sophomore, juniors, um, there is that basic minimum expectation for the number of courses they must carry in order to be a full-time student through that process. And so that's what I think would help carry and maintain that we're not only taking six, six classes, six classes, or six credits, sorry. Um, the other thing that I think when we look at this is um, the the path by which you would enter. I love that Diane gently said that everybody would enters and it goes through high school with their own individual path is to keep in mind that you're only most likely going to end up in a situation where you're credit deficient because you've been failing some courses along the way and had to retake them as you went through. And so what we've discovered is many of those kids fail their core classes um, and they don't ever get to the elective courses because they're repeating the core classes. Um, so just kind of keep in mind the G GPA would be affected. So there's a number of things that the diploma in itself doesn't have to be, um, as we said, look any different from the standpoint that you're, you're not going to walk through this process with a four point, four point GPA and have a, attained the core diploma, if that makes sense. So um, it, it's, it's, it's for those students who couldn't get through all those electives because they've had to um, go through the core a little bit longer than other students. Thank you very much, Willie, and uh, really was instrumental in bringing this to the table uh, to highlight that this was uh, something that is being done in the state of Iowa across other districts, and so it um, put us in a position to be able to really investigate, put a team together, and uh, create uh, the proposal and, and the idea of, of the core diploma for Davenport. I would like to follow up with something that Willie had mentioned also, is um, that we're not looking at this core diploma in isolation either. There's some very concerted efforts, efforts around MTSS and being able to provide support for students just in time, just when they need it. So that is gonna be another layer of support uh, throughout the entire uh, pre-K-12 system for Davenport students. And then we also have had a team looking at credit recovery. So instead of waiting until senior year, how might we be able to support students who, who failed a class? And let's not wait until the end. Let's catch that and, and find a way so that we can recover those credits even as a freshman. So again, um, looking at this in, in a more comprehensive light, it is one piece to a very large puzzle uh, to ensure that students are getting um, not only a, a, a uh, diploma, a graduation diploma, but also be, being able to put them in a place of uh, success. So Ali, as she mentioned, with her, her level of expertise with CTE and being able to really grow that program. And, and um, I'm very excited about some things that are, are happening within the district plan, the district growing excellence plan, and things that will be happening at the building level. Again, providing options for students. So I, I do want to, to bring that caveat to this conversation too. One last thing I want to add to that is that when you look at a number of the school districts that we are aware of that already have uh, the core diploma in place, um, this puts us in a position to kind of even the playing field. One of the administrators in our own district that we talked to when we mentioned it were, was a little caught off guard that this was an option in other places. And so he's, they're competing, our high schools are competing against other high schools for that graduation rate. And when there's a modality that potentially there's 83 kids, and I, I want to point out if there's 113 kids who didn't graduate last year with the, the four high schools, that that's 113 kids who that finish line looks a little bit closer to who might be willing to have taken some of those other courses to put them in a position to move towards a graduation diploma. And so some of those districts have seen their graduation rates get closer to that 90%, which is the state average, because they've allowed for the core diploma, which I, I want to reiterate um, that this is the state level of assertion for graduation 
Um, and it's awesome that we have a higher standard than the state level. But keep in mind that when we're asking questions of, well, is it a valid diploma? Yes, according to the state of Iowa, which is what the superintendent says to the school board president and the school board, I, you know, uh, acknowledge that these kids have met, met the state standard in order to be graduates of the state of Iowa. So. I'm glad you pay attention to my speech, Dr. Bonnie. I appreciate you. <laughs> Director Potts, do you have anything? Uh, yeah, a couple. Um, one, what other school districts are we talking about that are already engaged in this process? Uh, Cedar Falls, Waterloo, Des Moines, Waukee, and West Des Moines, Walnut Creek are the ones that we know of. All right. Second, I would, I would, wouldn't we assume that if 17 credits is the state requirement to graduate from high school, that the state universities would accept that in their admission policies. We can and that's rhetorical. That, that's we'll rhetorical. Further. Yeah, but I, I would assume if, if this is the state requirement to get a diploma, 17 credits, then you would assume the state universities would be admitting. They may admit them conditionally where they have to, there may be an academic probation for a, a, you know, a semester or something of that nature. But I, I would think that if that is an issue, then there's, they're not in sync with the rest of the, the state. Second, if we talk about making a different diploma, my suggestion would be that the 17 credit one gets the, gets the high school diploma. The kids with 26 credits get a, a different diploma that acknowledges their additional achievement. I know I went to high school in the state of New York. The state of New York had a high school diploma and a regent's diploma. The regent's diploma, you had to have uh, seven more credits to get the regent's diploma. And so when you got that, it was noted on your diploma that this was a regent's diploma as opposed to just general high school diploma. That's all I got. I just wanted to mention about the the 17 credits from the state. So that those are the core for the academic, which doesn't address the electives. And so districts have the opportunity of being able to say, here's the, the core of what needs to be offered. And then of course the electives are above, above that. And then we do have chapter 12 that we are required uh, to meet the mandates on. And chapter 12 does have additional um, topics that we do need to address and sometimes those are added in a current core course or sometimes they can be offered as a as a separate course or built within a course so uh, within chapter 12 those those uh, would be a, above and beyond the 17 and then just to address the 17 that is core credits and that's how it works out units of credit that that's how it works out in Davenport because we're on block schedule those units of credit might look a little bit different in another district because uh, they're on a standard on a standard schedule. But just those are some technicalities uh, within those units of credit. Uh, and I also would encourage us to keep in mind that the additional elective credits um, are what the Davenport Community School District has determined are needed in order for a student to be a well-rounded student ready for citizenship career college and so that's that's that that standard with those electives and what we're looking at is that that next experience after that um, is that that next level and so I I would encourage us to maintain kind of that that standard expectation of a diploma that every student should strive towards every student's going to push towards and then we know that there's that next piece where um, due to life circumstances very, for a very small percentage of students. Um, and I love the idea, as these guys know, of a uh, honors diploma, which kind of makes a statement that you have gone above and beyond uh, the expectations. So, Is there any other information that the board would need. I'm assuming this will come to us in July sometime. Um, 
I do like dress director Potts's uh, suggestion on the diplomas because I think if we do above and beyond the 17, it should be something different. Um, <clears throat> otherwise, thank you for the presentation and uh, educating us a little bit. Um, we will move on to subject 11.04. Social Emotional Learning Curriculum Adoption. I will turn it over to the superintendent. Thank you very much. And as our team makes our way back up here, um, this is something that I'm very excited about. Um, how, how, whatever direction we go forward, it's incredibly important that we have a core curriculum, a core method of delivering um, social emotional learning and in Davenport schools there's a very long history of life skills in our schools um, you know teaching perseverance teaching empathy and it's incredibly important for us to do that probably now more than ever and <clears throat> just just like some of our other programs that were approved um, later today for, in terms of our curriculum the tools that our educators have right now are outdated and they need to be updated. What you're going to see is an update of the tools that our educators will be using because we haven't updated them in a while. Right currently, we, are, we have second step in our building. And um, if you see the data on second step, it's not something that our teachers um, feel is very effective. And so the, this, this uh, what you're about to see today, I'm incredibly proud of the work that has been done, the cascading that has occurred for this, um, the, the eyes that have seen this. This is a huge next step for us, in whatever direction we head. Because before we can even understand, if this were math, we, would, we know we would have to teach that before we would intervene. The same thing is with our, with our social emotional learning. We have to put it in place where we are teaching and at every level. And, and what, what those lessons look like at a kindergarten and a, and, a, and a senior are completely different, but they're still incredibly important. And we, as a system, need to move forward with the ability to teach those lessons because everything that we do after that depends on that. Because after that, we, we, can, we, don't, we don't need to assume that they don't know it. We know that they've been taught now. What's the issue of absorbing that lesson? Um, so this is a critical uh, component, important uh, piece of our next steps in our behavioral continuum and our at-risk continuum, uh, every piece of this. And plus, I think about when your kids come home and they say, I had this lesson with the counselor about conflict. I think about when your kids come home with these rich strategies of what to do when someone's being mean to you, what to do. When you see someone being mean to somebody, what to do when, what to do when, what to do when. And they're, they're incredibly important. And now you think about the world that our kids live in today with social media and, and the things that they're facing. These, these skills are, ne are never more important. And so I'll turn it over to our team again. But this is an incredible, whatever direction we head, this is an incredible, incredibly important part teaching our students social emotional learning. Um, I know that I've pushed our team really hard to get to this spot to where we have a core curriculum. This is what we do here. This is, this is how we teach here. This is how we behave here. This is what it looks like to be a good citizen here. That's what we're looking at today. And I'm, I, the, this is the direction um, that I think we, is, is incredibly important. I say, I've said that four or five times. Um, but we definitely need to ensure that we're teaching these lessons every day to our students. So I'll turn it over to our team. They're much more better spoken about it than I am. Hello again. I'm going to kick us off, and then I'm going to pass it to Kami, who will lead us through the rest of the slide deck. She co-led a task team through this adoption um, process, which I think is a perfect example of collaboration because Kami was representing learning supports, Aaron Rome was representing special education, and then we had Melissa Tremble, who was representing our learning results department. So amazing collaboration. So our why for being, well, our attendant outcomes, we want to showcase our proposal around the SEL curriculum. 
our why is the same, like we established in our last presentation, that the social, emotional, behavioral needs of our students are changing, and we have to recognize that and adapt. And then ultimately, we want to implement SEL curriculum in all grades at all ages to provide students with the appropriate social, emotional learning, just as our superintendent was speaking so passionate about, because ultimately our goal is so that all students feel safe and engaged and connected within our schools. So now I'll pass it over to Cami. Sure, thank you. Um, just to kind of reiterate some of the things that um, Superintendent Schneckloff has said that, you know, it has been, I was, you know, the principal at Jefferson for eight years, been at the district level for one at SMART before that, and it was second step that whole entire time. So I can only speak to what I know. I've been here 20 years, and I don't remember an SEL curriculum adoption that's happened in the 20 years that I've been here. So just case in point of the why, it is time, it needs to happen. Um, and so that really does bring us to, you know, we'll go over the reasons why we chose what we chose, and I want to walk you through just a kind of a snapshot of what this team evolved from from the beginning of the year till now and all the depth of work that went into this decision and I think that takes us to this slide we are very excited about not only the three of us that were able to co-lead this we all brought a different lens to the table for sure and the eclectic um, group of people that had their say and input on this as you'll see there are a couple of teachers here and we wish there would have been a lot more however we had to do half day retreat days on all this work and we just couldn't as your, to your point earlier, pulled them out of the classroom as often. So we made sure throughout our whole process that we were surveying teachers, that we were surveying counselors, that we were surveying and administrators. We truly wanted the voice of the whole, knowing that people couldn't sit and do all the depth of the work the whole time. So that was just something that we were, you know, that I feel very proud of, that we really were asking the teachers, what is it you need? What is it you want? How can you move this forward? They were the most important voice in this and that we kind of got our hands dirty and did the work. So um, throughout our survey results, we have hundreds of responses that we comb through and things like that. It was very apparent, you know, um, to the comments at the beginning that we were ready to evolve from second step, that we were not seeing our students engaged in it. We were not seeing the results we needed from it um, and so on and so forth. So lots of other, you know, um, points that were taken up. So we got a curriculum adoption team together. If I just had to give you a snapshot of what that team looked like this school year. Um, it, we followed the curriculum adoption process that was put together by, you know, the learning and results team, the amazing handbook and document. We followed every step. And we realized very quickly some of the pieces, not that any curriculum adoption is simple, just weren't as simple. It wasn't the idea that there's one curriculum that exists out there. Let's look at that, compare it to others. We ended up spending two quarters. Um, we thought probably a quarter and a half longer than we thought, just scraping what we currently have in our district. The results were... Um, not surprising to some of us. I think that's what, that have been here a long time, knew that was what was going to happen. And some people on the team were, were kind of astounded and shocked. It was anything from some things that teachers had on a shelf for 25 years that they were still using from some were using parts of second step, but, you know, we're only using a few pieces of it, not in its piece. And I see Karen Klein drum going, yes, I know. So he knows exactly what I'm saying. And it just became piecemealed over the years. And people, some people were saying they were doing it and they're like, I just can't put my kids to this puppet show one more time right so it just it was a very eclectic finding that we found and really set the stage for the work we have to have something we have to have it be you know it has to be consistent a big piece of this um so I'll get to that next, sorry. So we, after we did all of that, then we realized we need to look into everything that we don't currently have in our system. So we used the CASEL select criteria. So CASEL are, you know, the deepest standards in SEL curriculum or in SEL in the area of social emotional learning that we have right now. And they have select criteria. It means they met um, and marked all the boxes. Along with that is the depth of the data that you want to see, that it has been field tested and proven that it has made results. So we picked, there was about, I think, 14 team of those programs. Then we spent almost a quarter analyzing each of those. I would say our team has become professionals. They could probably read to you the rubrics that we used in their sleep to know what to go through. So that was the next step of the process. After that, they became so fluid with those rubrics, they wanted to find things on their own and bring it in. And we said, okay, as long as you do the selection process first, it meets the criteria, then bring it to the team. That was the next cycle of um, process that we went through. 
then we really started to say, now we really need to go back and focus on our work because what is tier one and tier two and tier three? And we had to keep bringing the team back, say what we're doing right now is we're looking at the tier one social emotional curriculum um, to the point made earlier that we have to teach it first. Then we can talk about how we can intervene and all of that. But so we had to keep bringing our team back to that because it's almost inevitable that it lays in layers of our pyramid. So bringing it back to the tier one layer, we spent a lot of time, almost two months, just having to then take everything we found and say, that's more of a tier two type of thing. What is our tier one? What are we teaching all kids consistently district-wide? What do our lessons look like? So that took about a half of a quarter. And then um, we really narrowed it down to about six, and you can list them here, companies that we wanted to bring in. We had more questions. We liked a lot of it. It hit a lot of our rubric examples. It set the stage. It met our baseline. But is it right to bring in district-wide? So we brought many um, companies in. We brought Second Step in, even though teacher results said don't look at it. We wanted to give them due diligence and say an amazing presentation and good stuff not a good fit for our district, the team decided. Um, so Character Strong was one, Quaver Ed was one, Leader in Me, and then we brought in MVP, which is the high school layer that um, we could put at a different time and challenge to change. We realized very soon as this resource mapping that MVP, for example, is not the tier one curriculum that all kids get. It's a, a, an amazing layer that can be added to our system. It's not the thing. Challenge to change, the mindfulness, all of that has a place in our layer, not our tier one. So we really started to um, kind of pigeonhole us to where we wanted to go. And after lots of diligent work in that, we came to Character Strong. So Character Strong is the tier one curriculum that we would like to propose to move forward with district-wide um, for a plethora of reasons, really. We, even our team, then when we got to the point, it got down to about two. Character Strong and one kind of a soft three. And we really wanted to go and we got sandbox um, materials. And all of our team went through and did the lessons themselves. How long did they take? How engaging would that be? Brought in teacher collaborative partners and things like that. So the reasons we chose Character Strong, again, I'll surface a few, and I'm sure there are plenty more that I will forget. It is research-based, field-tested. It has been a piece of it. Does it come in different languages? Has it been field-tested in communities like ours? You know, all of those things. So it marked all of those boxes. It is a pre-K through 12 curriculum, which is something that we didn't find many places. A huge piece of the conversation that came about in this task team was, what are we doing for transitioning from pre-K to K? What are we doing for in, in the area of social and emotional learning from five to six and or six to seven, um, from eighth to ninth grade? And the answer was, we're not. And so we really wanted something. Going back to that um, idea that we need this consistent piece, we need our transients populations to go from one thing familiar and find something else familiar um, when they land there. So that was a, another big piece of it. In the in-depth deep dives with the lessons, the engagement, the, um, the uh, what I guess I would say the implementation science. So Dr. Clay Cook is um, with the Character Strong organization and his implementation science is just something to be noted, amazing. If you haven't heard about him yet, you will as time goes on. And his whole thing is the low high. It is low burden, high impact. And that is exactly what this is. Um, it is not something that a teacher needs days and hours of training. And it is, this is truly based on the implementation science that it is low burden to the teachers. Is there a little piece that needs to be done? Yes. Are they doing it already? Yes. They have second step right now, which in our survey results, they were telling us they were doing more work because they were trying to supplement and make things more engaging of what existed in front of them already. This exists. It is engaging. It goes from the surface level learning quickly in depth scenarios and conversations and generalization. So those are some other reasons why we really liked these topics. And the whole piece, as you can see here, is building kind, strong, and well humans. And that is pre-K through 12. Uh, I could go on, but um, another piece that we really liked about this was the cyclical curriculum. So it was they hit it, they come back to it. They hit it, they come back to it. Um, that is the implementation science piece, that social-emotional curriculum is not like multiplication where you learn your facts and you know them. It is as you evolve, as you get older, being kind, being strong, and being well means different things, and it evolves throughout um, the ages that we really liked as well. A lot of their research is heavily based in the high school level and at the secondary. I mean, 
having to have it in all. And we, that also really drove the high school members of our team to say, finally, something that really has been research-based and tested in high schools and has shown results. So those are just some reasons why uh, we, that Character Strong came to the top for us. Then the last piece would be the budget. You see the low burden, high impact um, here in the budget as well, that to implement this, a teacher needs two hours of virtual training. That's all. Um, and they are able to hit the ground running. It's more of here are your resources, here's how to navigate them, here, you know, here's what this looks and feels like. And then back to the implementation science piece, the strong piece behind why that works, that that's all they need to implement, is there is a character strong champion in every building. That's that implementation science piece. We are looking at really getting our counselors at the beginning of the year to kind of start to spearhead that work. And they said that's where the magic happens and something we haven't done in the past. They are the ones that make sure every PD there's something mentioned about character strong. What is our theme this month? What are we doing as a building for that? Everyday morning announcements have something to do with that theme. It's this whole child approach versus it happens for 30 minutes a day and that's all. So that was another big piece of why we really loved um, the idea of implementing this in our system because we could really see some some strong gains there you can see the prices here the professional development they are willing to give us a nice um, deal on that typically it would be two thousand dollars a building and it is each building gets a separate training because in the implementation science they said you can't put everyone in one room and have everybody connect to the information it has to be by building um, and so they're giving us a nice as you can see that's not two thousand dollars per building so they're working with us there um, they had agreed to give us Walcott for free um, on top of this and so you kind of see that in the total here but it would be that you can see there's a high price in the beginning of the rollout and then each year that cost for renewal is much lower and we just kind of threw in there so you could see what we currently pay for a second step I think that's all I have questions uh, director Klein Jerome where does this I, I can visualize where this is taught in an elementary classroom you've got a you know half day full day with kids even in the intermediate, where does it get taught in high school? So currently there is, and I think, you know, we were talking about this with Mr. Flynn things earlier. If you want to jump in, I don't speak as eloquently to the high school, but there is that MTSS advisory time that already exists. They're looking at, you know, putting in a different place to be more effective, but that time has already existed. And those teachers have been, you know, finding resources for that time. And now this is that consistent resource for the time that already exists. I would, I would just add to that. Um, our principals are already trying to process this. There is a time for MTSS that is, it's an expanded block at this point in time, but they're looking at creative ways of regrouping the kids so there's still a, a freshman level advisory, a, a sophomore level. As you know, there are mixed classrooms throughout much of the day and we wanna be able to streamline both on the delivery of a potential curriculum and some of the other pieces that are in place to best service our kids. One example would be MVP. Um, that's a freshman level uh, piece that we're, we're continuing to provide. Um, so our principals are working through this right now, but the time is allotted. Director Beck. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm, I know you mentioned um, that you uh, interviewed everybody basically, <laughs> about what they didn't want. Um, do you have teacher testimonials, particularly, or school testimonials for this program in particular yet? Like people you, who've used it? I will say for our level, we have met with company people, and they have given us and passed on those testimonials. We haven't specifically talked to the teachers ourselves. And is there a plan for like at the end of the year? Yay, this is working. No, this is not. With any program implementation, we will want to commit to looking at data, including impl fidelity of implementation, right? Are we implementing it like we're supposed to? And then how is our students responding to it? Um, I'll also add our AA attended a Character Strong conference this school year and also spoke very highly of it. And we're very excited to learn that we were going to be implementing this program. 
also with that too, Clinton is in high implementation of this program. And now that I'm thinking about, we did speak to some people in Clinton and Aaron Rome who couldn't be here tonight, did a lot of um, work with them when they implemented and had that testimonial as well. And I think our CFL data is one of the huge pieces. Well, you know, this would build those safe and healthy classrooms for sure. It would be just one piece of what we would measure. Director Potts, did you have anything? I thought it was a very good presentation. Uh, you can tell that uh, Ms. Montoya is very enthusiastic about this. Uh, I, it, it just struck me when you look at those characteristics that we're trying to instill in children, honesty, you know, gratitude, courage, perseverance. Those are the things parents taught their kids and, all, and the school reinforced. And we now live in a time where we're teaching these things and we may have to teach the parents how to reinforce these honesty and stuff in kids. It's like the world's turned upside down. Thank you, I forgot one thing. There is a parent component here, which is one of the reasons why we chose this as well. It's the weekly letter, what even up to the high school level that can go home to say, these are some things you could be doing at home with your children to instill these things. And we liked that also. Okay, that proves my point. My goodness. I think this is an excellent idea. Director Pinesville. I also wanted to say that having been a teacher who taught second step, it is about time we found something, something. Is there any other questions or any other information board members want? Is this going to come in July sometime too? Thank you, ladies, again for the awesome presentation. Greatly appreciate it. We will move on to policies for board second discussion. I will turn it over to Director Klein Jerome. Uh, these are the policies that we discussed at the last meeting. Are there any questions about it? Okay, they will be voted on at the next meeting in July. Administrative reports. Not at this time. <laughs> uh, board request. Uh, tonight we have one board request. Uh, name of the board member making the board request is Director Klein Jerome. Date of request 6 26 2023. Item requested is an agenda item. Description of request uh, develop a plan to bring district communications back into the district. Why are you requesting this information or agenda item? Uh, typically, typically, outsourcing has not saved the district money, so we should consider bringing the communication department back into the district. Also, we have learned a lot about getting our information out to the public the last few years, and we should now apply that knowledge with our own internal personnel. Is there a second? Second. Uh, when would you like this? When would you like this information or agenda item? July board meetings. No other board request. Uh, board reflections. We'll start with Director Potts. I said I would. My uh, takeaway from this meeting is the excellent conversations and discussions we had on the champs business, because we rejected it last meeting, and it was revised. We talked it through, and we approved it unanimously this time. So I think that's, that's, that's just part of, of our own growth and development and our own ability to reflect our thoughts and get a positive change in response from the administration. Thank you, Director Beck. Um, 
I agree with what Director Potts said. I also um, wanted to mention that we uh, went through 13 items for action, items requiring action, um, and uh, voted on them uh, relatively quickly because we have this system of discussing things at one meeting and then uh, getting all of our questions answered before we vote on it at the next meeting. And so um, I think we all really appreciate the ability to uh, get that discussion out of the way in advance because had we had to discuss all these things and vote on them, we would not even be close to here now. <laughs> Director Poston. <clears throat> well, one of the things that, that hits me is all the uh, new curriculum uh, Thank you, Director Hayes. A special thanks to um, Lisa, Courtney, and Cammie for their help with the champs. It was not very clear last time we discussed it and the extra work that was put into it. I'm thankful that you guys brought it back and made it very clear. And I also enjoyed your curriculum discussion. You're very detailed in what you're doing and we appreciate that. Thank you, Director Klein Jerome. Um, I also appreciate the presentations we've had tonight or have been very detailed. Um, when we're committing a lot of money to a lot of different things, we as a board need to know those details. And so I appreciate that. I also appreciate the fact that Josh, you're looking at some natural gas things because my bills keep going up and down. So I can imagine a district this size that if we can lock something in, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Uh, Superintendent Schneckloff. I'm just incredibly excited about the turn towards proactively teaching, proactively utilizing curriculum in the, in the area of social emotional learning. You know, if you look at, we've had posters in this district for 30 years that say initiative on them that I think one of our students created. And so to get some updated tools in our hands, to be proactive, to be out in front of things. As an administrator, to have champs in my hand with brand new teachers would be incredibly powerful. My conversations are rich. As a teacher and as a principal, the first two, three years are incredibly important to establish those routines and procedures inside of your classroom. And so to have a tool to do that, I, I'm just incredibly excited for. And now, now it's upon us to make sure that we are m moving those initiatives forward because they're gonna, those tools in our educators and teachers' hands are gonna improve outcomes. And the other thing that I'm really proud of our board for saying is I wanna see the outcomes um, because that's, the, that's exactly what we're talking about. Um, with our team and I'm also really proud of our team I mean they they work incredibly hard to stay connected and um, I don't know I, th I think they've worked incredibly hard so far this summer and I'm very proud of the team thank you um, I appreciate all the discussions we had tonight Josh, I, I greatly appreciate that you actually have a construction background when you bring up projects and you can answer questions. Uh, it's a huge thing, so I greatly appreciate that. Um, I also want to thank Ivy for stepping in tonight. Um, Brenda's not feeling well, and I hope Brenda feels better. And Ivy, you've been doing a great job, so I appreciate it. Um, but you're no Brenda T, and no offense. But. Whoa. I just wanted, I didn't want to get She's in, happy right where she is. Right, yeah. <laughs> what do you think about it? Um, again, thank you everyone for the great conversation. Uh, before we move on to the interviews of candidates, we're going to take a five minute break and we're going to, we, I think we have three candidates on Zoom, so we'll make sure that we have them all connected and everything and then we'll come right back to it.
Can you guys hear me down there? Yes. What's the holdup? Karen's investigating. What? Working out some tech technical difficulties. Okay. Gotcha. All right, we're back. Um, we'll move on to the section, the interview the candidates and appoint a board member to vacancy. I do want to note for the record that three candidates did withdraw their letters of interest. Uh, Jamie Snyder, Mark Halloway, and Richard Thomas. Just so everyone knows for the record. The Davenport Community School District Board of Directors announced the process to fill the vacant school board seat left by the resignation of Director Karen Gordon. The board accepted letters of interest from members of the community for the vacancy until 4 p.m. Thursday, June 22nd, 2023. Those submitting letters of interest will be interviewed at tonight's board meeting. The board will vote later in the agenda to select an individual to temporary fill the vacant term. The individual selected will be sworn in at or prior to the regular board meeting on July 10th and take their position on the board on July 10th, 2023. The appointment to fill the vacancy is temporary until a successor is elected and qualified at the next regular school election on November 7th, 2023. Because there are fewer than 180 days until the election, the appointed board member will serve until the general election in director oh wait in november when they could choose to run for the remainder of director gordon's unexpired term or step down the newly elected director would serve until 2025 the remainder of director gordon's term 
the purpose of the Board of Education is to provide governance and, the po and policy for the school district. It is not the board's job to micromanage the district. There is a time commitment to serving on the board. There are usually three Monday meetings a month plus a monthly committee meeting. The board member appointed tonight will serve on the local school improvement advisory committee. Occasionally, there are also special call meetings and workshops. Service on the board also involves reading agendas thoroughly prior to board meetings. The process for tonight is to listen to each candidate's answer to four questions. You will be allowed, the candidates will be allowed two minutes per question. Just to clarify, this is an opportunity for us to hear from you, but it is not a conversation. The board will narrow the field to two candidates and then a written ballot will be taken to determine who receives the majority of the votes. Finally, a motion and second will be made to appoint someone to fill the open seat followed by a roll call vote. Ivy, would you please give us the order? Okay, and he is virtual. Um, the questions, there were two questions that were provided ahead of time. Uh, the first one was tell us a little bit about yourself, and then the second one was tell us why you're interested in serving on the board. Uh, what we will do, uh, each candidate will have two minutes per question. Uh, so uh, you said Mr. Barnes was up, right? Mr. Barnes, if you would unmute yourself and uh, answer the first question of tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for uh, accommodating me uh, virtually, and thank you for your service on the Davenport uh, Community School Board. Um, my name is Kent Barnes, and I reside in Davenport and have lived in Davenport for the last 18 years. Um, I am uh, currently serving as the Executive Vice President for Innovation and Strategy at Augustana College, and Augustana brought me to this community. I reside in Davenport with my wife, Jenny, who is a preschool teacher at St. Paul Lutheran uh, Preschool, and uh, we have three children, um, all, uh, uh, all students in the Davenport School District. My daughter, Martha, graduated from Central uh, in 2022. Um, I have a daughter, Sophie, who will be a junior at Central, and I have a son who will be an eighth grader at Sudlow. Um, my educational background is I've earned both a bachelor's degree and a master's degree, a master's degree in management from Regis University in Denver, Colorado, and a bachelor's degree from Gettysburg College in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, I believe in the power of education. I've committed my life uh, to higher education, working in, in higher ed, for 31 years, um, I probably could have provided a little bit of input about the admissions process uh, for your discussion earlier about 17 credits versus 26 credits or classes uh, because I am an admissions specialist at Augustana College. I also have fundraising experience. So that's a little bit about me and I think that's within the two minutes. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, the second question, tell us why you're interested in serving on the board. I have um, several reasons that I'm interested in this uh, type of board service, but I'll start uh, with the sort of global view. Um, I believe strong schools build strong communities, and I want Davenport to be a magnet uh, for people. And I think currently right now, uh, we see in our school district more people leaving the school district than I think is desirable, uh, moving to other local school districts. And as a result, I don't see Davenport as that magnet uh, for um, uh, people uh, moving to the area or switching districts. And that's something that's important to me. Second thing, um, my son, Ben, uh, within the past uh, few years, has seen five of his friends uh, transfer to other schools outside of Davenport's uh, school district. Um, I think that's a problem. I think it's becoming an epidemic, and that's something that I think needs to be addressed, and we, and I know that the school board has been uh, thinking about that, but I think that that is very, very uh, important as we uh, think about the future of the school district. 
Um, I'll also say that I have experience both as a, as a board member and also working with boards. Um, my experience in education is to listen to teachers first. They know best of what should happen uh, and how to work with students and get the best out of students. Um, and, and that is certainly something I would bring to this. Final thing that I would say, and one of my interests uh, is I, I believe in serving the community as a whole and uh, would, would very much so welcome the opportunity to serve uh, the many students and families in the Davenport schools. Thank you. Uh, the next question, what is the most important issue facing public education? I think one of the most important uh, issues facing education as a whole uh, is the, the loss of, of credibility uh, for the educational enterprise. Uh, we have more and more people who have lost confidence in what happens in our classrooms and how we are preparing students for the next step, whether that's from elementary school to middle school or middle school to high school or high school to higher education. I think that there's a credibility crisis I'll also say that I think um, in particular, I think that the Davenport schools uh, don't do enough to reinforce what a desirable school district we have. Um, the levels of diversity, uh, the opportunities that are available to students. Um, I think that that is, is a crisis that is local uh, that combines with this uh, credibility crisis that we have in education overall that we've got to address as, as a nation. Uh, the other thing that I would say is I do think that um, funding um, and the resources, uh, we talk a good game as a country about how important education is, but education is chronically underfunded in our uh, nation, in our state, in our community. Thank you. Uh, the last question, what are you most proud of in our district? That's a great question, and I, I really appreciate that, that question. I'm going to talk about two things. Um, one, I can say that for my three children and Jenny and myself as parents, um, we have benefited incredibly uh, from the, the levels of diversity in our school district. Um, I think that the levels of diversity have taught our children about life uh, and about navigating life in a very meaningful and compelling way. Um, I will also say that I'm incredibly proud of our teachers uh, and coaches. Um, all of my children have had wonderful teachers and have had an extraordinary experience and have, had, have seen transformation as part of their experience in the Davenport schools. Final thing that I would mention is um, in my role as uh, executive vice president at Augustana, uh, each year I've had the, the great privilege of participating in the interviews for the Thomas Dooley uh, Scholarship, which is one of the most prestigious scholarships uh, in the community. And each year I get to interview from uh, West, from Central and North, uh, the very best and brightest uh, in the Davenport School District. And it, it just makes me uh, beam with pride about how uh, these students talk about their experiences and the transformation that they've had in the Davenport schools. And it reminds me what a rich blessing we have in this community to have the Davenport schools. Thank you very much. Um, You're welcome. I do want to notate, I don't know if I did it earlier, uh, Laura Yankee was one of the candidates and she is not on. We have tried uh, calling her several times as well as following up with an email. So she was supposed to be the first one and that's why we moved on. But I just wanted to make sure I had that noted in the minutes. Uh, up next, we will have Mr. Barnes. Huh? That was, ah, man. Zarn, Zarn. Without the B and the A. Can you hear me now? Okay. Uh, the first question, the same as the last candidate, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. And you get two minutes. Yeah, I'll question. keep it down, keep it short. I'm born and raised in Davenport. I went to Jefferson, JB, and Central. Uh, and then obtained a degree in construction engineering at Iowa State, Bachelor of Science, and uh, <clears throat> moved across the country. Uh, I lived mostly on the West Coast. I lived in Los Angeles, 
uh, Seattle, San Francisco, Anchorage. I even worked up in Prudhoe Bay. I worked for numerous states across the country. But when it came time for my kids to go back to, to, to start school, uh, I moved back here to Davenport for the education of it. Um, when I was going to school, I'm pretty sure I was ranked number one in the nation. And I would say at that time, also the United States was ranked number one in, in the world in education. And that may not be true, but, but pretty close. And uh, I know I think we're ranked number seven, uh, 13. So that's kind of what I like. I'm supposed to be talking about myself. But, uh, I have a wife that I'm happily married to. I have six children. And uh, I've worked for both Russell Construction and Estes Construction uh, here in the Quad Cities and finished my career with uh, Twin Shores. Uh, first building that I built in the Quad Cities was the compost facility, and then there's been many since then. Is that two minutes there? Good. Oh, no, no, I'm good. Uh, the next question, tell us why you're interested in serving on the board. I'm interested in serving on the board because I think it's a great opportunity. Uh, my understanding is that the last director that left is because of the time commitment. Uh, I find right now that I'm in a perfect position. I retired four years ago. And, uh, but more importantly, uh, the education that I got at JB and Jefferson and Central, along with the degree from Iowa State, I have one for nothing. And so I recognize the importance of education and that's why I like to give back to that and, and make sure that we're doing the best we can. And I think you guys are. I mean, nobody was here complaining about your board meetings or anything. You didn't have any attendance. So that shows that you're running a well-run show. Uh, the third question, what is the most important issue facing public education? Uh, the most important issue is that uh, we're, we have to make sure that our kids are learning. I don't know what's happened. Uh, I don't know why it's more difficult today than it was when I was a kid. Uh, but it should be able to be worked out. Uh, it's so important for our kids to get a complete education. And I do have two opinions on that 17 credits and all that. And then maybe I sure don't want to see it to be a pathway as a kind of a easier, softer way out of education. Not at all. Uh, the last question, what are the most, what are you most proud of in our district? I would have to say that the district is, uh, the school district, when I say school district, I'm talking about the teachers, the administrators, the whole, everyone has tried their best to bring about the best education. Uh, I'm proud that I, or that Central is, 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 is recognized as probably the best high school in town. <laughs> so I think that's a good job, but I, I'm proud of uh, the, the uh, just the education that we're getting. I just want to improve it, make sure it's going in the right direction. And can I add one thing? Uh, I th also think it's, a, it's fantastic that uh, Mr. Hester was uh, named after this boardroom, or the boardroom was named after Mr. Hester. When I was going to school, he was instrumental in my life. And uh, during the summers, he w would be at the park, at Jefferson Park as park director, and I would trash him in uh, chess. We played chess all the time. He couldn't hardly beat me, but he would beat me. Uh, my dad father finally stopped playing me in chess. Uh, Mr. Hester was the only one that I think maybe he was the last person to ever beat me in chess, but he was a good man. So with that, I'll pass. Thanks. Thank you. Miss Upchurch Taylor, come on down. Yep. Good, yep. Good evening. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, first question, tell us a little bit about yourself. My name is Charlene Upchurch Taylor. I uh, taught in the East Moline School District for 38 years. I taught eighth grade language arts. I um, am married. I have three kids that also went through the Davenport school system. 
and I have lived in Davenport for 39 years. That's the, one of my children, just, the twins just turned 39, so I know that. Um, I'm very much involved in the community, and I'm a lot involved in the community. Um, I'm a, I um, also, I serve on the NAACP under WIN, which also does a program through the school system. And then I also help Jamie uh, Walker Salas with the young group, group of girls at Williams. So I am in the schools. I am um, been president of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority twice. I am also on the Davenport Civil Rights Commission. I um, also serve as the Grand Worthy Matron for the state of Iowa, and I am over five chapters. I um, do the Quad City Youth Conference, and that we, I think you send your students to also. It's a two-day event. One day is for middle school, and one day is for high school. And um, through that, let's see, what else? I am, um, I was nominated um, four out of 40 women in the Quad Cities for a remarkable woman as a leader for the Channel 4 News, and that was in March. And I think that's about enough. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, tell us why you're interested in serving on the board. I'm interested in serving on the board because I'm invest I've invested in children all my life from teaching 38 years. Plus, I give back to with going to Williams and working with the young ladies. I think uh, under when we're sending, uh, we sent uh, some students to the shows, the, the movie theaters this past week. And I thought that was really good because some students don't have things to do in the summer. And um, also, I go back in and I do the testing with the students over in East Moline, the makeup test. So I do the map testing and the IAR testing. And I do that three times a year. So I'm always involved in with things like with children. Even now with our um, sorority, we have a group of, we call GEMS, young ladies we work with in the community. So I am interested always in what is happening with our youth. Thank you. Uh, third question, what is the most important issue facing public education? I believe one of the most important issues facing education is Times have changed. I think our students, when I, when I retired, I think our kids see so much um, issues in, in the environment, so much hatred, and it's coming from adults. And when you see that coming from adults from the top, and then you expect children to come to the classroom and to behave normal when you have it in your household, when you have it on the news, I think it's what we set as an example for our students, is what they're portraying back to us in the classrooms. I think that program that you're starting for, for social and emotional, I think that is what is definitely needed. And I say that because when I was working with Jamie with the young ladies at Williams, we taught the social and emotional. And it was impressive to see young ladies go from those that like to fight when the program started to listening to them talk and being excited about a program. So I think uh, when you talk about social and emotional problems, with students, things that they're lacking at home, I think it is very important. So that's one of the things I see as a problem with our students. Thank you. Uh, last question, what are you most proud of in our district? I am most proud of the fact that you got your accreditation back. I think that was a lot of hard work for you. And I think that um, that shows the, um, the need for improvement. That also showed the willingness to improve in the areas that you were lacking in at that time, budget-wise, program-wise, whatever. And I think that um, I see your programs that you're initiating. I think that's important because it also it reaches out to students that have come from different backgrounds. And I think that's needed because everybody doesn't come from some of the home lifestyles that we, we expect and think they do. And I think when you're reaching out and trying to serve all your students, I think that is very much important. I see that in the community, in the Danforth schools. And um, I think that it's something that needs to continue. That CHAMPS program also is good. Thank, Thank you, you very much. <laughs> Ms. King, you are up. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, first question, tell us a little bit about yourself. I retired in 2020 after teaching English in high school for 31 years. I moved to Davenport to take a teaching job, and I've been very happy here ever since. One of the best things about retirement is that it's given me time to do some of the things that I've always wanted to do and never had the time when I was teaching. For example, I volunteer to do data entry at my church once a week. I also, every other Monday, go over to Augustana and read the news to people who are visually impaired through their public information service. And I volunteered to do the newsletter for the Scott County Democrats. Um, I also like to read. I garden extensively. Um, and I really enjoy being part of education. I have subbed a little bit, but I've discovered that I'm kind of through with the day-to-day -day stuff in the classroom, but it's still, education is very important to me and I still want to support it as much as possible. Thank you. Uh, second question, tell us why you're interested in serving on the board. I want to be part of the board for two main reasons. The first one is to be an advocate for teachers. I feel like teachers are being pushed to the limit and from some of the things some of my friends tell me, they aren't being listened to. Teachers are the experts in the classroom. And so whenever there's any concerns about curriculum or any changes, people need, the administrators in particular, need to listen to the teachers, what they're saying about it. And secondly, I want to be an advocate for the kids. I want every kid who walks into every school in Davenport to feel like they belong there, like they're welcome there, no matter what their situations are. I know, um, and I was interested in one of the earlier presentations where one out of three kids reports mental health problems these days. And I think we really need to do something to help those kids because otherwise they're going to lead miserable lives. It's not just what they do in the classroom, it's what they're going to do for their whole life. So I want to be a supporter for both teachers and for the kids. Thank you. Uh, third question, what is the most important issue facing public education? <laughs> There are lots of issues facing public education, but one of the most important ones is the lack of funding for schools. It's not just about paying teachers, it's about having enough program support, about having enough support people, such as paraeducators, counselors, even lunch ladies. Um, and I think that people keep pulling politicians keep pulling the money away from education and don't realize that without all those support people in place, schools can't operate the way they should. And um, it's really hard to know what to do about that, but I think we have to keep advocating to fund the schools adequately. Thank you. Uh, fourth and final question, what are you most proud of in our district? The thing I'm proudest of about the Davenport District is you've got some awesome teachers. I know some of those teachers are good friends of mine, and I see what they do and how hard they work for the kids they have, and that is so impressive. And I know just from the few that I know that the schools are full of really good teachers who really want the best for their students and work so hard for them. Um, I think that's something that Davenport should be proud of. And I think it's something that needs to be more public so that people are more aware of it. Thank you. Thank you. Miss, I just want to, Miss Yankee has not joined us. Okay. Okay. Yeah, if you could check, that'd be great. Uh, for the record, uh, we have interviewed all of the candidates, and uh, Miss Lori Yankee still not has still has not signed on to the Zoom or uh, replied back to the email or gotten back a hold of anyone.
ready? All right, so what we're going to do now, board members, take a few minutes. Um, pick, a, pick your top two candidates, and then what I'll do, I'll call on each board member and ask you what your top two are. Ivy will record it, and then we will do a uh, paper ballot to determine one candidate out of those top two. Director Potts, you heard that right when I call on you, give your top two. I heard you. Okay. Uh, Bruce, do you have your top two? I uh, <clears throat> I do. I'm all. I have I have W. Kent Barnes and King. Okay. Uh, Director Postion. Uh, w. Kent Barnes and Charlene Taylor. Uh, Director Beck. Um, I have uh, Kent Barnes and um, uh, Miss Taylor. Uh, Director Hayes. Turn your microphone on, please. I'm Charlene Upchurch Taylor and Mr. Barnes. Uh, Director Klein Jerome. Uh, Kent Barnes and King. Okay. I have uh, Kent Barnes and Miss Upchurch Taylor. Sorry, I didn't have my mic on. Did everybody hear that? It was and then vote on this slip of paper between Barnes and Upchurch Taylor. Are you sure your name was on it? Yes. I will text I will text my vote to the board president. You beat me to it, Bruce. I appreciate it. That's all right. Yeah, check the phone, buddy. Okay. okay. I, Bruce Potts, cast my ballot for Barnes. 
I, Karen Klein Jerome, cast my ballot for Barnes. I, Director Hayes, cast my ballot for Upchurch Taylor. I, Dan Gosa, cast my ballot for Upchurch Taylor. I, Kent Poshin, cast my ballot for Barnes. I, Allison Beck, cast my ballot for Kent Barnes. Kent Barnes has three votes and is the winner. because of Director Potts. Thank you, Ivy. Um, may I have a motion? So moved. No, you gotta read oh, that. I yeah. know we're doing it in German, sorry. <laughs> no. The new, no, don't have it up on the screen. Director Beck. I move the board appoint Kent Barnes to fill the current vacancy on the Board of Education. The successful candidate will begin service on July 10th and serve until the general election in November 2023. Thank you. May I have a second? Second. Any, dis any discussion? Um, I want to thank the candidates for their interest and encourage your in continued involvement. And also I encourage you all to run for office in the fall. Um, seeing no other discussion, I will do a roll call vote. Director Beck? Yes. Director Klein Jerome? Yes. Director Potts? Yes. Director Potsgen? Yes. Director Hayes? Yes. My vote is yes, motion carries. I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Is there a second? Second. second. <laughs> Any discussion? Seeing and hearing, then I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Ayes have it. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>